I'm happy that the room is full pretty much, so it looks like. All of you should have one of these handouts, a piece of paper. I put one on each seat, so uh, if you get a seat, there should be a piece of paper. There's some free one here and maybe a few others around here. Okay, just a few words about myself that you know who's talking, talking to you. My name is Mike Müller and uh, I've been using Python since 1999, so it's quite a while ago when I discovered it. This version 1.5 was kind of very in the niche, so you didn't have many people using it. It's changed quite a bit, obviously. You see in the conference here. And in 2004, I started teaching Python and increased this quite a bit over the years. And 2010, I, since 2010, is pretty much uh, uh, takes the most of my time preparing and teaching, preparing courses and teaching Python. This will be a tutorial about faster Python programs through optimization. Here, uh, I gave this tutorial uh, over the last PyCoins here, and I'm I try always to Im improve it. But it seems like there's demand for fa faster Python programs. Just a few questions about you: Who is using Python less than one year? Just one person. Less than two years. A few. Less than five. Yeah, about a third. More than five. Must be the rest. About half of it. Okay. Though so it seems like people are pretty experienced experienced with Python already, so you're not newcomers to Python. So I don't teach anything about the Python language itself. It's just about what you can do making things faster. Uh, I gave you, uh, I sent you a few emails. Hopefully you got, uh, got them with some download links. So if I haven't downloaded the material yet, this is a material. This is a link here. Uh, you can download the material. So if you haven't done so yet, please do so. And also there was a long instruction how to install things. So if you haven't installed yet, you can still try, but it might be a bit uh, too late. You can still participate in the tutorial for sure, but it would be nicer if you have things installed so you can work along. Uh, I try to be interactive. The thing is we have quite a bit of material. As you can see here, it's a more than 90 pages somewhere. It's quite a bit. And therefore, we have to go a bit faster. Usually I have exercises. and. This is more or less, if you have a whole day for it, you can do exercises. We have to skip the exercises, so you encourage to do them as, as homework. Uh, do something there. Yeah. This link is for the submission of the method. Oh, yeah? Sorry. Oh, uh, yeah. I didn't. Oh, yeah. I co that's, that's a link. I didn't, I didn't copy the right thing. That's optimizing, obviously. Uh, did, it did, it said, I said copy it, but didn't copy for some reason. So that's the right link. So HTTP, of course. Yeah. So that's a that's the right link. Uh, sorry for this. I didn't copy the right thing into the cache. Uh, this should be some of those source codes we use in here, and everything actually. It's also in the handouts, so if, even if you don't have it, you can at least read it in the handouts and you can see the material there. Good. So, I will go now to a different, just get this, try to get this one, and I just will talk a little bit before we actually do st and start doing something. So every single that's here in the slides actually that's that's just the handouts. So I just have pre reformatted a little bit so it's easier to to see. The the first question actually is uh, you should ask yourself how fast is fast enough? Do you actually need this optimization we, we want to do here? It's kind of a strange question, but it's an important one um, because you don't want to optimize things that are not it's not really necessary. And you will see we will spend quite a bit of time on measuring systems. Uh, which is, I think it's very important because if you don't know, if you cannot measure, if you can, cannot quantify, you cannot improve. That's very important, one of the important messages. And I'll show you a few tools you can use. It's not all of them, but a few you can use uh, to do measuring. I just have the selections. There are more around, but uh, we don't have time to cover all of them. And some of them are very similar, but there are certainly other tools. 
Okay, a few uh, optimization guidelines. I wrote them down here. So you don't want to have a, a do optimization too early. There's this. There's a citation here. I just got an email today from somebody who said it might 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 not 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 be Hori, it might be Knut. So it's not really clear who said it, but it doesn't matter. It's still true. Uh, that premature optimization is the root of all evil. So very often you, you can say it's a selection of a programming language can be a premature optimization. You have to use a sampler, you have to use C to make it fast, which is not necessarily true. And the last years, the trend is totally this way, working with very high level languages like Python, and then get some tools helping you making things faster. So get the burden to make things faster on top of the computer. You don't want to hand optimize too much. You want to use tools as much as possible. And we will look at a few of them that are around. So before you start optimi optimizing things, you really think, do you need it? And you have to make sh sure that it works because very often, not always, but very often optimization comes at the price. So I like optimizations that make your code clearer. Uh, there are a few of them. So we look at a few data structures, things you can use to make things easier to understand. But there might be situations where things get more difficult. If you get in other tools and you start writing extension things, obviously that's much more work than just doing it in Python, and you have to really make sure that's worthwhile. And that's something uh, I try to get across here, uh, that you really, really have a case for your optimization. And it sounds, sounds very common sense. It's common sense, but very often people get kind of overwhelmed to opt with optimization, and that's why I try to get this across. There's a few guidelines, so everything's written down. You can read it also. Uh, so make sure it's really too slow. That's it, 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 it's a tough question because it depends very much on the context you're using your things. Uh, it's, it, will it will be used by more people later, will scale, things like this. There's a lot of things you have to consider, and it's not very easy to answer the question. Things might change over time also. And especially, don't optimize as you go. go so you should, you should never optimize code uh, uh, just for the fun of it. Just f make it work right first before you optimize things. That's very important. And of course, you should have tests around so you make sure that things don't change when you do things. So don't just say, okay, this, it's going to be slow. So uh, this is a tendency people have. Sometimes I have a gut feeling that's slow. But very often I'm, I'm wrong. So even if you have experience, you might be wrong because you didn't consider some other facts. And after, after, uh, after you looked at them, it was pretty clear, but in the beginning it might not be that clear. Also use only realistic use cases. So if the application is just for a few people, you don't need to necessarily make them fast for a lot of people or things like this. Whatever it's important for your application, you have to really consider uh, if, you're really, if it's a really realistic use cases. Also architecture, how you th things are set up in a, in a higher level. So it's like a higher level al algorithm, you might call it, how you put things together. And this might cause uh, problems and not necessarily that, the, that Python is slow which is not always the case, but there might be a lot of other things involved. So, for instance, uh, there might be bugs. Yeah, some people had this story uh, two years ago at, at your SciPy, scientific Python conference. They had this Fortran application doing this, this uh, accelerator thing, this physic big physical device, and they had a Fortran application looking at the data. And then they rewrote the whole thing in Python, and it is still covered the bug. And eventually, the Python version was much faster than the Fortran version. But they would never have seen this bug in Fortran because it's difficult to, to see. Uh, because the code is very legacy, very old, and nobody really understands it in all detail. But the Python program is much simpler. And the end, it was faster than the Fortran because there was a bug inside. And that can happen. And the next thing is, very often, if something is too slow, not your whole program is slow. Very often, only part of the program is slow. And that's important. And that's all about profiling. So we will spend a bit of time on profiling to find out what part of your program is slow. And this is very important because you want to focus your, your energy on this part. And this is not that easy sometimes, but it's worth it to put uh, some, some thoughts on it and use a few tools i show you here to profile. And always check the results. As I said, you have to have tests around to, 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 to find out what is slow, what is not slow. That's, uh, uh, but what is right, what is not. Um, that not that's nothing changed. Sorry. So nothing changed when you optimize that you don't introduce bugs. So if you don't test automatically, then you might not find that something changed. If you have a pretty good test coverage, then you will see immediately if something is different. 
So we're going to look at also a data structure later on. We'll see about this uh, performance things. And also, you have to take into, into account a lot of boundary conditions of your application, like a network connections, as I have here, database access, system functions. They might be much slower than anything else. There's a few resources here. Uh, there's other resources. I don't, haven't listed all of them, but just a few examples. But you can, uh, can find some more information. OK, this is the introduction. So just assuming we have the case, something is slow, we want to optimize. That's what the whole tutorial is about. The first thing, and the, the maybe the most important part, is uh, in the strategy you want to measure. You have to measure something. So you need to measure how fast things are. And uh, one thing that comes with Python is, is kind of a benchmark. Benchmarks are always a bit difficult because benchmarks uh, always usually just represent a small part of things that are benchmarked in one way. But typically, it, 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 it's the best to have. You have some, some benchmarks. So you can try this, this PyStone. So if you look in the uh, Python installation, you probably find this PyStone file under tests there. So and if you have this PyStone file, you can you can run tests and you can see how fast things are. This is, it's a test, so you can run it with different uh, architecture, with hardware, different operating system, or different Python versions. And that's what I did here. You see, I'm, uh, I just have this, uh, I use uh, this, this PyStone, I just copied it here. So we have PyStone. Uh, there's a PyStone, the Python 2 version, the Python 3 version, and then you can just call it, and it gives you some information how... <coughs> I don't know now, so... Is there any problem with it? Can I kind of type things in? PyStone, and, and then you execute it, so it, it, it tells you that's py, uh, the, what PyStone it is, and so how many times it's doing it, and how many PyStones per second it's doing. And you can do the same thing, for instance, with PyPy, so if you install PyPy, and you do this with PyStone, then you see PyPy should be a bit faster. And you see now up there is about 76,000, and PyPy has 400,000 PyStones per second. So it's, uh, yeah, about, if you see the time, about five times faster for this special benchmark. It's just one of them, uh, but it comes with Python. And you can also run other benchmarks just to see, get, get a feeling uh, for this type of things, how fast it is. So you can also use, use Python 3. So I have Python 3 installed here. And you can use PyStone. You use a different version of PyStone, PyStone 3, because uh, syntax is a bit different. And then you see that's Python uh, 3. It's a bit slower than Python 2 on my machine here for this benchmark. It doesn't mean that Python 3 in general is slower. It just means for this benchmark is a bit slower. That's, that's one thing. So you can have this. Uh, uh, this benchmark, and I have a, have a few helper uh, programs here uh, you can use to to work with bench with, with PyStones, and uh, this is one of those helper programs I'm I'm showing here. Uh, it's in the directory you downloaded if you unzipped it, unzip uh, optimizing. And then we have this measuring. And if you go into measuring, you'll find a bunch of these uh, helpers here. And one of them is called uh, PyStone. Yeah, there it is. Uh, so you have this uh, PyStone converter. So it's, it's trying, now it's a bit big, I guess. Uh, Because my resolution changed, everything is a bit shifted. So that's just, a, I try to import the module PyStone here, and then I get this PyStone, which gives me this, this two, the, the PyStones and this benchmark time, and then I just convert it, divided by 1,000 for the number so big, and uh, have this small converter function here. So we can, we'll use this later, later on. Okay, the first thing, you should do if something is going on is profiling. So profiling is a big, is an important part uh, uh, of your optimization efforts. You have to find out what's going on, where things are. And there are a few tools you can use for profiling. I want to show you the, the one that comes with Python, which is the easiest to, 
to go for first. So if you have this, um, it doesn't go down. So uh, this is this program here. And there's, there's a few of them. One is called Profile, one is Hotshot, and one is C Profile. Uh, I think the one that they use now is C Profile, which comes with Python, and this means it's written in C, so it uh, has less overhead than Profile. The problem is when you measure something, you always influence your system. There's no way around it. So if you, as soon as you're measuring something, you change what you measure. That, that's always like this. The artist, to have this influence, you have small compared to what you measure. So if, if your influence is like 5%, that's kind of okay. If it's 100%, it's maybe not okay. Uh, something like this. And this is difficult because as soon if you want to find out the influence, you start have to measure and you influence your system. So that's not that easy uh, to, actually, to actually quantify. Uh, but C profile is written in C, so the influence is less. Uh, and you get better, better numbers. So let's see some examples uh, what you can do uh, with uh, the C profile and how you can work work with it. I have an example here, and this one is a, is a file called uh, Profile Me. Profile Me, and I have just two very simple uh, functions. One is called Fast. I, I use the time module here, and then I sleep for thousands of a second here, and here I sleep for tens of a second. Those two orders of magnitude difference, yeah? You see two orders of magnitude difference, and then you just have two other functions that just use a, a loop and call this function a uh, hundred times. But that's, a, that's just my first example function. And then you can use profile uh, to do the, do the profiling. Actually, what, what I do, I would like to use IPython here. Who of you installed IPython? A few people. So if you have it, it's fine. If not, you can still use a normal interactive shell, but uh, using IPython has advantages. It's nicer for me to, to show things, to demonstrate, and it's also easier for you to see. And I will show you the IPython notebook, and just a short introduction to this very interesting tool, which is very, very common in, um, uh, in uh, the scientific Python community. There was just a tutorial in the morning about IPython by Fernando Paris, who is the author of IPython. So IPython is more, it's quite a few years old, I've forgotten how old, but the new IPython notebook, it's around just for a few years, and it's a kind of a killer application. To do this, you just say IPython space notebook, and if everything is installed, then the IPython notebook should come up. So it will take a few seconds, and it should start a browser, you need a kind of a modern browser, so Chrome, Firefox will do if you're on Windows Internet Explorer 10, not 9. And it takes a, a little bit because it starts a server, and then it should start something like this. It starts a new notebook dashboard, as it's called, and it starts in this directory I, I start from. I'm still version, using version 1.1. Just a few days ago, version 2.0 came out. I didn't want to install the new version because I haven't used it yet, so I just make sure to don't get surprised when I do the demonstration here with the new version. Uh, the new version will have new nice things, but has different like keyboard shortcuts, so I didn't want to change around. But for our for our purposes, it's, it's it's good enough. So if you have if you see this, then you can click on new notebook and you get a new notebook. And that's what you want. You want to have a new notebook. And this is just a normal like an interactive Python shell, just a normal interactive Python shell, something like this. But you can also here. Uh, first of all, I can rename the notebook, just click on it and rename it. Yeah, so give it a give it a name. And then the actually the, the notebook is called like this. And this one also offers you something like shell access. So even if on Windows you can type ls and you get a listing of the current directory. See, I have this optimization file, I have my I put my Python files here. And then this is my optimization subdirectory. And you just can go CD up and down, for instance, here. And also, uh, here I can write text. And then I can change here instead of code and can use markdown cells or heading cells, also markdown. And then if I press Shift Enter, <coughs> which executes the cell, I have text. And I can write 
text in here. I can have, have pictures in here. I can use HTML. I can have cells with JavaScript and a bunch of other things. So it's a lot of things you can do with it. And it's very nice because it's a mixture of an interactive prompt, but also you have the cells and you can edit sim similar to an editor. If you have a normal interactive prompt, it's only li line by line. If I change something, it can be really cumbersome. And here it's very comfortable going to copy and paste easily and do things uh, very nicely. So I'm just now uh, turn off a few things here so I get more uh, screen real estate so I see better because I use a big font. How's in the, in the very back of the room? Can, can you see this? Is it big enough? Yeah, okay, good. Uh, so I know, of course, I, I'm going to spend uh, quite a bit of time uh, in this interactive prompt. Good. First of all, I go to the directory to be able to import things. So I could go to optimizing uh, measuring. Yeah, and I can always look inside. So I don't need to go back to the shell all the time. I just can stay in here and I get this uh, shell-like comfort here, which is nice. And I can say import profile and you see it gives me call tips. If I say tap, it takes, it takes a second to think about it and then it gives me this, this call tips here. I can import profile meal and import uh, C profile. So that's C profile, which is my profiler I want to use to profile Thing. So profile me is uh, the file we just saw. You can also, if you like to, you can also load profile me. So you can also look inside here. See, that's the content of the file. So you can look at the content of the file right here. But we imported already, so uh, it's fine. Now you see a few things what you can do with profiling. We have our profiler now imported. And now we can use it. And the first thing is I make an instance. So I make my profiler P, just make it a bit shorter, and C profile dot profile. Make an instance of this. And now I have this. And can get rid of this one. And now I can use this, this, this instance of the profiler, which I call P here, in different ways. And the first one is, say, run call. Yeah, see, give me call tips, which is nice. And then I throw in my function profile. Profile me is my module dot uh, use fast. So I want to have this function use fast, and I just throw it in as a function, and then uh, the profiler is doing the profiling, and then I can uh, take the profiler p and say print stats, and I get stat statistics out of here. And you see, that's a, that's a built-in profiler. IPython itself has, a, has a, what's called a magic command profile, which is doing pretty much the same thing. But I use a standard one, just for a few people don't have IPython uh, working. So this one should work if you use a normal standard Python. Uh, it should work the same thing. If you go to the directory where this profile me program is, so you can import it without setting any paths. And then you see here, uh, a little bit statistics. It's a little bit uh, because I have so big a font. Uh, the formatting is a bit good, but we can still see it. So you see the number of calls, the total time it takes. So it's so fast that the rounding doesn't show the time here, but also the cumul cumulative time. So the, ho the whole time it takes. Yeah, because this function is used calls only one, but it calls hundred times this other function is a loop. Remember? So if we had this. This is this function, doing the, doing the loop 100 times and calling fast. That's why you see this, uh, this calls here. And then you, you get a feeling how fast things go. This is just, just two functions. And you see if you have a real program, this list is typically much, much longer. And you see way more about what's happening uh, with your function. Uh, C profiler can only resolve to functions. We will see later on you can also use line profiler to get uh, finer things. So that's, uh, that's the thing you can do. Uh, and you can get uh, quite a bit information uh, out of your thing. Let's do another profiling. So I use another run call, and I say profile me uh, use fast, and then you can compare, and you can see what's happening. And now I can. Uh, I, the only thing, as, as far as to retrieve a cell easily, is just copy it here. And then you see now I have this uh, second run, and see now there's a, 
I'll use fast again, I want to use slow, sorry. That's why everything is twice, so I want to use slow. But you still see it, you see now uh, it's still running. Takes a bit uh, to run this one, yeah. And see now we have make more calls and we have this flow function here and you see it takes 10 seconds. Yeah, so if you do 100 times uh, and this, the time delay is about 10 seconds, it's pretty, pretty close. And you can see now if you have something like this, you have some kind of feeling what's going on and which function takes how much time. You see this per call, this 0.1 second. And it's not exact, of course, because there are some overhead calling the function, and also the measurement is not always correct. Every time you measure or make some mistake, you have to be aware of this, while you shouldn't go to the extreme with those differences. It's just like order of magnitudes, it, it's a good uh, thing to look at. If it's just a few percent, more or less, then you might not be sure if this, that's really due to, to your code, or maybe also something that measuring introduces and things like this. But you see a very big difference here. Uh, of this 10 seconds compared to this uh, 0.2 seconds. I did it, did it even twice, so it's twice as long in this case because it still has everything uh, what I did before. So you can do quite a, a few things with this uh, 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 profiling. So there's a few other things you can also use is cprofile.run and then you can Instead of using the module, you can use a string, and now you can evaluate a string as a profile me, profile me dot use fast. Yeah, and call it like this, and this will have the same effect, and you can see this the now the the run here. It, this starts a new statistics here, and you have this 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 calls here and you can see the similar times. So point 0.1 is the time we had in the other one also. You can also, if you like to, save those, all those things under, uh, with a file. And if you do this, uh, we can uh, later on reuse this with a program we want to use to get some nice graphical output. So this is, uh, uh, so I give it here. Uh, a file name, fast stats, so the statistics for the fast case, and run my my file. And now I have this uh, this file, fast stats here, uh, and in there I have my statistics. And now if I if I like to, I can use the stats module and actually look at them later on. So you can do your profiling, store all this data in this, this format, and then uh, post-mortem you can do analysis, and you can say import stats, and no, import pstats, sorry, and then you have this pstats module, and you can make, can look inside uh, your file you saved and then you have this S and then S works the same as we did before print starts here and you get your statistics printed so this way you can save everything in files and can look uh, at these things later on so there's a few things you can do with it so you can sort all those statistics uh, in all kind of, of things. So if you want to, you can have a lot of different ways to sort it just at the command line. So you can say sort s dot sort stats and then you can say by what you want to sort like by calls calls and then yeah, you say print stats and you see them sorted by calls. This would be, uh, here see it, and 100 is on, on top of it. You can also have other criteria like time and so on. So there would be a lot of ways you can look inside and can evaluate what's going on. Time and a few other things as, as here. You also have the, the possibilities to, uh, to look at the, the callers. So you can say 
s dot print uh, callers. That's one way. Then you see uh, who's calling whom here. And you can also say s print callees. Print callees. And then you say, okay, I want them for use fast. And then you can find out what's going on and see who's calling whom here. And th 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 that can help. So imagine this is much bigger. And you don't only have this two function working, so a few hundred or a few thousand functions that some, some are doing something in, in your program or different calls, whatever. Uh, and then you can have a lot of uh, possibilities to sort and sort through. So that's just an example uh, what you uh, can do. OK, uh, per default, this uh, C profile uses the wall clock time. That's, that's a time that actually elapsed. So there's a real time from, from start to end. Uh, this is pretty practical because that's what you actually care about. But for measuring, it might be uh, a bit difficult because in your system, usually other things go on. And y you never know what's, what else is going on in the background. So usually what you do you, when you do profiling, you do sev things several times and see what, what is the fastest or an average case or something like this uh, to see what's, what's going on. But you can also uh, use different times. You can also use the real CPU time. And let's have a look at, at a simple function here. I just open a file. And this is a, a the file Clock check. Okay, this one. So when I have this uh, this file, and actually I use a different uh, a different function. I make it a bit smaller so you can see it, or at least move this over here. And I use different times of uh, of functions here to to measure what's going on. So I see I use OS times zero, which gives me the first entry in this OS times tuple there. And I use clock and I use default timer. So depending on your operating system, you might see different, uh, different results because unfortunately, at least in Python 2, uh, this time clock uh, can give different uh, uh, values um, for different operating systems, for Unix systems and Windows systems. And therefore, uh, yeah, I used times zero here and let it run. So if I do this, I just go to the... Uh, to this directory, and let the thing run. Python clock time, clock check, I call it. And it takes a while. And you see now here uh, this different, the different times. So the the OS time zero, the clock, and the default timer. So of course, uh, you see differences here. At this place, that's that's a source code. And I have this time sleep in here. And I just have the loop. I, I do one plus one a million times. But I measure everything, including time sleep. But time sleep sets a, a processor to sleep. So Python doesn't do anything. And you see the differences. So the default timer measures the time actually including this one second sleep, where the other one measures the time without. You see the differences here. And you see OS time actually measures the same, just somehow the resolution is not as good. And you get this one. If you run the same thing on Windows, you might see the different, uh, different results. I don't have Windows machine running now here. I have a virtual machine usually testing this. You might see different things. You have to be pretty aware of what you're measuring. Uh, in Python 3, uh, there are some, in, some new things, some new modules, like there's a perf time in the time module, which uses default timer. 
So actually, if you want to measure time, you should always use a default timer, not time clock, because it can have a different meaning. Use, you can use time clock on Windows, but not here, because it has a different meaning. So that's why it uh, uses default timer, which is from the time it module. Time it default timer, that's what I'm using here. At this place, you see, time it default timer gives me the timestamp, and I subtract those two timestamps to get the real wall clock time, so the time that actually elapsed. Whereas this, this clock gives me the CPU time that the, really the CPU used uh, for, its, for its work. That's a big difference, so because if you don't do it right, you might get very different results in your measurements and it might mislead you. So you have to check uh, pretty much uh, what's going on there. And you can uh, look at this. So if, if you run this one, and uh, you see uh, different results. Let's look at the file the CPU time. So if I open this uh, CPU time file, and here I wrote a, a small helper a little bit, just some internal conversion, so it should work with Python 3 also. So if it's less than, if it's Python 2, I use I said range to X range, just to get the same behavior. And you see, if I want to have the CPU time, though the, the time actually CPU uses, then you can use time clock in Unix systems. But as far as I know, we have to use OS time zero and Windows 32. I haven't found any other solutions so far. If you don't want to use them, any special like Win32 uh, extension modules, then you have to use this one. And then you can see this is the CPU time here, and the other one is a, is a real runtime. We have two functions, sleep, sleeps for two seconds, and this one's just doing uh, 100 million loops here. At this place, doing one plus one. And I use post, both of them, and then I use a profiler. And now what I can do with a profiler here, uh, I can provide my own function. So if I don't do anything here, it uses a normal uh, 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 default timer to do this, but here I use CPU time, and now it use, measures the CPU time for profiling. So you can, give it a function object, so everything is an fun object in Python, as you know, so it's no problem to use this function here, which I wrote myself, this one up here, yeah, and just hand it over. This is the standard thing we just did before, exactly the same, and this is now a modification where I use a different uh, CPU timer, and if you run this one, then you see differences. So let's run this with Python, uh, what was the name, CPU time, yeah, and if you run this one, it takes a few seconds because I have some sleeps in there. And then you see well now what, what profile is spitting out. And you see here the, the differences. So this is the first one. Uh, here, using this uh, default timer, you see five seconds. And here I use the second one, only three seconds. Because this two seconds sleep are not counted here. Yeah. So you have to be careful do you, what you want to measure. And this sleep could be something like you're calling an uh, external process or something where, where actually the Python process is not doing anything, but the external process and you're waiting, you're blocking for something. Do you want to measure this or you don't want to measure this? Yeah, Depends what you want to do. The, the blocking, in the end, accounts for your runtime, but it's not Python that's making you slow. It's something else because it's not the CPU used by Python, but by other process in the meantime when you're just waiting. Uh, things like this, and I just mimic this with sleep. So this is something when you measure, you should pretty should be sure what you're measuring. Sounds pretty common sense, but it can be can be frustrating if you spend hours and days trying to fix something that's not to be fixed because you used the wrong measuring. You measured something wrong, and that can happen. Happen to me. That's normal, but at least when it happens, you should learn uh, that you did something wrong and try to to dig it deeper. It's just some hints. Uh, it might depend very much on your application. So I cannot just give you that you have to do like this and always do like this. You always have to be open-minded and think through and try to understand what's behind it. That's important. The recipes are good, but sometimes you should try maybe at least different re recipes and see if they're all, all broken, gives the same results. And if they are different, then you have to dig deeper. So that's something you have to, have to all be a bit, a, bit, a bit aware and don't be too much, don't believe too much in what you're measuring. Always questions, uh, question a little bit what's coming out of there. Okay, this is um, the measuring with these different types of time here, what I wrote down. 
and you can see this. And if you run the same thing on the, on the Windows, I have, to have it just in the printout. So if you have it in the Windows, you can see some different numbers. Let's look at my slides. I have it there. So if I uh, go to this, no, that's, that's all this thing here. So if you have this, uh, sort it by time. And this is this CPU time thing, source code. And you see there has this uh, three different things to measure. And then on Windows, you see that that's actually what you get on Windows. You see a different thing. You just saw the Unix version up there. Yeah, you see the OS time and clock is the same, whereas the default time is different. Here, OS time is a, is a real CPU time. And these ones are the same, obviously. Exactly the same numbers. It's just rounding the last digits here. Yeah, it does not kind of display. But exactly the same, because the operating system cannot measure that exactly anyway. So it's exactly the same here. Uh, these are the, are the same, but this one is a, uh, it's, it's different. See, get about this times here. It's even faster, which is strange because I run it on a virtual machine and should be pretty much the same. But here, this pretty coarse at this place, so that might be a rounding problem, something also. Okay, and then if I do this, and uh, this, this is just the source code I took, uh, took apart here in steps, and I run it on Windows, then you see uh, this result. Here, if you use the, uh, this, uh, this one, and, and you here also you see this result, you see differences. So it's a little bit different times, but if you use the CPU time function I just wrote, you can also measure the CPU time on Windows, and you can measure the CPU time uh, on Unix systems. So I, I, I'm not aware of any other operating system that might do something different. So since VMS is not supported anymore with Python 3.4, you need to look at this one. Okay, this is a... Um, the way to, to profiling. Now, uh, there's uh, some tools here to help you do this profiling. One of them is Run Snake Run. So, I had uh, some feedback from some of you. It was difficult to install. Run Snake Run uses WX Python and an other module. Uh, to do this nice squares, but what what you can do, you can use Run Snake to actually uh, to actually visualize your statistics. So if I say Run Snake and give it the the file name fast stats here, what I just generated, it should take a while, and I should come up with a nice colorful map showing you uh, what happened here. So this is that's the result of the my run. You see, the left hand side is the table. It's pretty much what we saw, the printout. But here, this is those boxes. You see, every, all the time is spent in this, this box with the sleep, and the other boxes are like, like this. And you can click on it, and you get a bunch of information about those different boxes. Yeah. So it's very simple. So, and this is very obvious. You, you want to get this box faster some, somehow. And the other boxes don't matter too much, obviously. This helps a lot. So, Depends if you're visual, but a lot of people like visual things, and that really helps to do this. So to, to show a little bit more imp impressive picture, uh, I have here prepared one. So that would be uh, the same thing as we saw. But if you use it on um, uh, on another function we use later on, we, later on we want to use NumPy for our example. And if you use NumPy for our example, since NumPy is a library that uses a lot of things, you see something like this. So it looks very different. Yeah? You see that that's a lot of things going on behind the thing. Actually, NumPy is much faster than using uh, pure Python. Uh, but a lot of things go on behind the scene, and the picture's not that clear. There's only a few bigger ones, but not one big one, but several ones. And you have to look at, at them, uh, where they are. And a lot of them are usually beyond your reach, because they're inside NumPy. And you won't be able to go and change what NumPy is doing, but you might be able to do uh, reach the same thing with a different kind of approach. In NumPy, you might get those boxes, boxes smaller and get the whole thing faster. That's something you can try. Uh, typically, of course, you cannot change the, the functions in, in NumPy. But this is a very nice uh, example how those things are going to look like later on, and you have a pretty good impression. If you have a lot of small boxes with all the same size, it will be really difficult to optimize because you don't know where to start. If you have one big one, then you're okay. That's where I have to go and make it faster. Unless it's like our box, it's sleep. So we also have to see what it's doing. It's just waiting for something. And of course, if you change the, the, 
the time measurement algorithm, you will see differences. So if you use the CPU time, you will see different boxes because the sleep wouldn't have so big an impact anymore on the whole thing. And then you will see differences. Good. That's about profiling, though there's way more. I, we, we cannot spend so much time uh, on it here, but it gives you some impression what you can do. And you can go and discover and, and see what's going on. And if it's your own code, you can change the code and rerun those analyses and see if things change. So there's a quite a bit of experimenting involved uh, to see that where, where the problem is and then look in the code. And if you're, if you're lucky, you find something very quickly that, that you can change that helps you to improve things. Good. This is a... Uh, C profile, which comes with Python, and C profile is nice, but the problem is you can only, the finest resolution you can have is a function. You can only say this function takes so much time, you cannot look inside a function. So, of course, you can argue when you write Python, you should write very small functions, though there shouldn't be a big problem. The problem is we use tools like NumPy or things later on, then one line of code can do quite a few things, uh, and very often it's difficult to, to write functions around which would introduce another, another overhead. And therefore, there's another tool called Line Profiler. And this Line Profiler helps you to uh, um, do line profiling, line by line profiling. So if you don't have it installed, uh, I just close this one here. My application, where is it gone? I close it from here. Yeah, so if I don't have line profiler installed, then you can uh, use pip or conda to install it. So if you don't know, I have a conda installation. I just say conda search line profile, and you will see of this thing is installed. Of course, you have to type it right. And then it's not there, though I can say pip search line profile, and then it should find it. You see it's a line profiler, and I just install it, and you should also have it installed. I have, of course, I have it in different environment here, and it's installing line profiler with pip. So this is, this is a nice tool, because uh, sometimes you have this problem that, uh, uh, that this, this, this resolution with um, uh, Functions is not it's not good enough, so you want to go line by line, and that's what I have here. So uh, let's look at a. It's an underscore. <coughs> ah, yeah, equal to one point zero. Profiler, okay, yeah, profiler. Thank you. Yeah, okay, good. So I have it installed, but now I use different distributions, so it's not in there, I just realized this, and it's always like this. Okay, so if everything installed, then you could should be able to say cron prof, see if it works, dot py, and it's there. So it's uh, written by Robert Cron, and he just named it cron prof, which is okay. So because it's a very good tool, and you can do things, and I say minus v, and then you can use the, the profile me we just wrote, profile me uh, here. And then it's doing a line by line profiling, and you see, now if you do like this, it works just like a normal, normal profiler, and you can, but you can get it to, to do a line by line profiling. So this works just like C profile, but you can also get it to do the, uh, line by line profiling. For this I have a different example here. Let's look at this different example file I prepared so to make to make a case to see something actually. So I go in this file profile me with line profiler. Okay. So I have this uh, same thing. And now what I need to do, I need to use a uh, decorator profile. So I just put the decorator profile here. And then when I run it under this cron prof, 
the ConProf is profiling this function at decorate. So <laughs> decorators are nice. I had that was a, a decorator tutorial. Decorators are nice because actually if you want to, you can just keep this decorator in, write your own decorator that doesn't do anything, and you don't have to throw it out if you don't want to. Uh, but now if you have this profile here, and now I can run it under the the, the current prof profile me uh, use line profiler and then uh, why doesn't it work mm -hmm. I should put it in That's always something nice, so it doesn't work. No con. Uh, if I run under conprof, conprof should should introduce this, this decorator into the uh, built-in namespace, and it should work. And. Minus L option. So I have to use a minus L option to make it work. I didn't do the minus L option. Yeah, you have to use a minus line option to make it work. So the decorator is still in there. Uh, now the minus line it takes much longer, as, as you can see. The line profiler makes things much slower. And But now you can see a line by line breakdown, what happens. You see now you have this uh, output here and gives you some information about the time, but also gives you information about every line, how long it takes. You see, the loop takes only 0.5% and the call to fast takes 99.5%, which is nice. So you can see, okay, probably doesn't make much sense to improve, try to improve the, the loop, which you can do anyway. But here, this call to the function is what, what takes the time. And here, this is slow. Since we only have one decimal, then 100% goes into the function and the loop doesn't take any time in this case, yeah. And the, if you use this with a faster function, the relation uh, would be different. So this gives you some uh, gives you some uh, information for a line by line uh, information about the code where things are slow, where things are fast. Okay, let's go uh, look at a different example. This accumulate example, which I wrote to show you how things work. So I have this, uh, this function here that's in the doc string it says what it's doing. Uh, accumulate the intermediate s uh, steps summing all elements. So that's actually in NumPy it's included if you work with this, uh, something like this, but I just want to do accumulate and you see accumulate range five gives you zero. Zero plus one is one. Zero plus two is three. Three plus three is six. Six plus four is 10, yeah? So that should come out of it. And here's the same thing. Just sum everything, but keep all the intermediate steps, so to speak. And that's how I implemented it. Um, I have my accumulate here, and it just make it take my iterable, whatever it is, take the first element, and then go to the rest of them and do something like this. So take this one, add it up, and append the new value, just as an example function. And then I use this, uh, this one here one with, with 10 and one with 100 elements, and then I run it through my line profiler to see a little bit more what's going on. So minus L, and now I use my accumulate. We have the same options here, and use my accumulate, and you see the outcome, and you see where things happening here. You can look at the output uh, uh, here, line by line, and you can see the times, and this one is e pretty e much equally dip dis uh, distributed between the loop, this assignment, this assignment, and the append. They're, they're between 20 and 30 percent, all of them. So you can see what's going on. This is interesting uh, to see if there's some time sync. Obviously, there's no obvi obvious uh, one that uses more time than, than the others. Another one I use is this calc here, another example. Uh, just to show you how this works. So we have this one, and you I'm, I'm just uh, 
do some mathematical calculations, I do plus multiplication, uh, power of 10, and I use a built-in power function, I use mass square root and square root. And just access to mass squared and square root here, because I assigned it here, so I don't have to do the extra lookup. So it can be interesting. And I run, run this one through my profiler to see where the times are. And then you see the different calculations, how long they take, measured uh, this time, you see. And you see, obviously, the, uh, the power, star star 10, takes 25%, and the power function takes a bit longer doing the same thing but they take much more, much longer than plus 10 or multiplication by 10, which takes about the same amount of time here. So, and you see that the lookup to square root, the mass square root is not so much different uh, because this is now in relation to the whole time, but still, they are pretty close here, how much time it takes uh, to do this. And the, here's a the difference obviously a bit, bit bigger. Uh, that might be also some measuring problem. If you measure again, you might get a bit different different result. So this is something can be very interesting to see uh, what kind of mathematical things you're going to use to another thing. So another example I would like to show you what you, it's always good to get some feeling about this local references here. So referencing things, global names and not global names. So here I use uh, the profile. So I try if this profile is there. Uh, if not, I define my own profile, so my own decorator, which is doing nothing else but taking a function, returning a function. There's a profile, a decorator doesn't do anything. So I can run it just normally without doing anything. And just the only penalty I, I paid is this one function call in the beginning when the module is compiled, which is usually not <laughs> that, that difficult. It doesn't take uh, any time that, that's measurable in any way most of, in most cases. And Otherwise, if I run on the profiler, then the, I can use this profile here. And now I do a few things. I just do this square root. I make it a local name. Instead of always saying mass.square root, I just say square root. And here I say mass.square root. And then I call both of them and see the difference between, uh, between both. So if I run it under the uh, profiler, then you see the difference and you get um, there's not a big difference here. Uh, doing this with this uh, local local referencing thing, they are pretty much the same. Okay, that's about profiling. So it's CPU profiling. If you think about profiling, most people think about CPU profiling, but also memory can be a problem, and memory also can have a, a impact on speed. Like in Python, if you work with lists a lot and you allocate a lot of big lists, it takes time to put them into memory. And depending how you access it also it can be pretty long. There might be other s solutions to, to uh, maybe limit the memory usage, but first you have to measure the memory usage. And measuring memory usage is not that easy. Uh, and to do this, you have to actually um, use some tools that help you to measure memory usage. There are a few around. I selected a few. Uh, one of them is HIP, another one is, is this another tool, and there's, there's a bunch more. I haven't used all of them, but they are kind of, kind of similar. Uh, with Python 3.4, the new release, there are some new uh, tooling inside Python itself to measure memory. I haven't used it because it's, I still do that. It should work with Python 2 also. Uh, but there's, there are some new shiny tools uh, that can be used if you work with Python 3. I haven't put it in there because I didn't even know when I prepared the tutorial that Python 3.4 would be out yet. So nothing for Python 3.4. There will be something for me to explore for the next tutorial, how this works. But there are a few uh, uh, third-party tools out there that can be helpful uh, to do this. And uh, the one of them, is a, it's a Guppy framework. And this is one is HIPI. So you should install HIPI. And then if I go to my IPython notebook, I should be able actually to IPython notebook. I should be able to import this. I say from Guppy import HPy. Yeah, so if this works, then you have it properly installed, hopefully. Uh, this is uh, this is a bit older and for quite a while it worked only for Python 2.6, but 
since a year or so, it works for Python 2.7. There's no Python 3 version yet, as far as I know, I think. Uh, should be possible to, to port this. Those tools, some very, very often, there's another tool also use. Actually, they, they don't care too much about uh, Python. There are some different tools doing it, and some of them, they just uh, use system tools to measure memory and so look at differences. The measuring memory is not that easy, uh, but it can help uh, help you to get some information. So I make an instance here of this HPI. Just call it, and then I can say heap, and I see what's going on here, and it gives me some information, uh, what's going on, and I see here ordered by data type how much space they take. So 35% of my memory is used by strings, 15% by tuples, then dictionaries, different types of dictionaries, uh, code here, functions, and so on. Of course, this is, I'm running an IPython notebook, so I measure quite a few things in the IPython notebook also. What, what's, this, what's important? Now, if I make a big list here, yeah, big list, so we are on Python 2, so I can just say range. If you're on Python 3, you have to put list around, which doesn't hurt here, to get a big list. And I just want to have 6 million, and I'm too, too lazy to count zeros, so I use scientific notation. And, yeah. So I have this big list, and now I can ag again say heap, and now I should get a different picture because I have this big list, and you see now the ints are on top. My list takes 16%, so the list itself is all these references to the integers, and then the integers, so 6 million inside my list, take so much memory. So this measurement of memory is not really fine-grained, so you cannot go by the byte, but you can go by this big numbers, and you can see now 47% are integers. Oh no, yeah, 47% are integers here. And then the 16% is a list, and 13% is string. It used to be way more before. So this gives you some impression what's going on. And then the main thing, how to, how to use it, actually, uh, it's here. You just can say set ref, and set ref kind of sets it back. So that's setting it back to a reference background. So pretty much to zero. Yeah, and then if you look at the heap, there's still something, but it's, it's very small. Now, if you look there, the sizes compared to here, th th those big numbers here, those big numbers, and here the numbers are very small. That's pretty much as close as you get to zero. That's, that's your background noise, so to speak. And now, you can do it again. Uh, this, uh, make this big list here. And then you make the big list, you will see the difference again. Oops. Big list again. And then you again you can say heap. And then you will see now that 75% is in the list and 25% is in, uh, in the integers and 25% is in the list. And the rest is pretty much zero because so small it doesn't have been 1%. So it doesn't show up anymore. Yeah. So this is, this is something that can help you if you use heap. You said ref zero before, and then say heap, and then you see the differences between two, these two calls. That kind of works, and you can get uh, some impression what's going on uh, with your memory. So I have this, maybe to speed up things a bit, uh, here uh, done several times in a row. Uh, several times in a row. So where we are. So memory profiling with this framework, and I just kept doing this heap thing. And you see, you can do this. You say heaps at ref, then you could look at the size, and then look at the size again. Uh, it's, it's smaller than the list, and look at the size. It's up again, and do it again and again. And you can also access this one. So if you have this instance, if you make an instance, you can access it in several ways. So let's have a look. So if I make make an instance here, I call it H, and have this one, I can look at it, and you can just look at the first, uh, first line here. Yeah, so you can look at the first line, you can slice it this way, so to speak, and you also uh, sort it in different ways. If you like to, like by type, you can say H by type, 
and you get it sorted by type. And you see, uh, there's 15 more. And if you want to have more, you can say underscore more to see the rest if you're interested in this. Usually, it's, you're only interested in the big ones. And you see the rest. And there's even more uh, later on if you want to see. So they just chunk it into size. Good. So I wrote a small tool again. So that's, it's very nice to write tools to measure uh, the size of the, of the memory allocation, memory size EP. And this is just a helper to do this. So I use a decorator. Just one example for, for a decorator. Who of, who of you know uh, how a decorator works? OK. So a decorator is very easy. It's just a function that takes a function and typically does something to the function and returns a new function, either changed or totally new function. And the syntax is what we had with this profile. So my profile is, it is a very, was a very simple decorator. This one here, um, I think this one I wrote, no, this one. This one is a very simple decorator here. Uh, this is just a function called profile that takes a function and returns a function unchanged. This would be a very totally simple decorator. It doesn't make any sense because it doesn't change, but it makes sense for me because I can replace the built-in profile and nothing happens. And this happens when you compile your module. So at, at compile time, when you import your module, Python goes through and creates this, this function object, and then it calls this function to uh, trans transform this function in one way or the other. And obviously, this profile thing uh, that kernprof uses, your line profiler, is doing something to get the line by line uh, measurement of the memory, uh, of, the, of the CPU time. And here, I just turn this off, so to speak, because by finding my own dummy kind of thing. Uh, the function here, the, mem the decorator. And now I, I get a bit more difficult. I write uh, a helper that takes a function here. And now uh, it's doing something. It's actually, see, this function returns a new function I just create that, that helps to measure the memory. That's what it's doing here. And if you want to write a nice decorator, you should always use another decorator that helps you. It's called functool reps because this helps you to keep the, the function name and the doc string and all kind of things, makes it nicer. And then I just do my what we just did on the command line. I use HPI, HPY, set it ref to zero. Yeah. Then I get my initial memory by saying heap size. So I get this number. And then <coughs> I try to call my function. And this is typically how you call a function. This is a star arcs and double star arcs takes all the arguments, all the positional arguments and all the keyword arguments in the tuple and in the, <coughs> sorry, in the dictionary. And now I can just hand them over to this function. So I can call this function and return the result. If something goes wrong, I still me measure the memory. And I do the same thing in the end again. You see, I just make a new measurement and take off the initial memory. So the difference between these two should be what happens in the function. And this is just, I don't only need to program this once. And then I can use my, my decorator just like this. And then it will measure the memory before and after this function call. And what it's doing, it sticks this in this dictionary. I have a, this global name memory here. It's a dictionary, and this will put it in. And you see it's using the name of the function and the memory. If I call this function several times, the last one will win. So if you want to make it more robust and you call this function several time, times, then you would need to check if the, if the is keys in there already and just uh, store all of them or store the average or whatever you like so you can modify this one. But this is a simple ex as example of what you can do. And you can throw in this one to measure memory. When if you don't want to, you can do the same trick as we did with this profile. Just write a, another one that doesn't do anything and just turns it off. You don't have to sprinkle if statements in there or anything like this. Just one to turn it off. And you see, because this one takes time. It will slow down your application for sure because it depends what you're doing. It might take much longer than the application. And then uh, I just let it run, and you see what's coming out. So I say Python. Uh, memory size HPI. So, and then it takes, tells me, OK, and you see, I see the function name, make big. I call it the function. And, and, I, and I see the, the memory that's used. Yeah? So that's in there. And this, you can use this as a tool and just sprinkle this decorator over the place. And if, as long as the functions have different names, 
then, so I, I don't store the, if you want to make an ISO, you should also store the module name, so module name dot function name, because you have several functions with the same name, you use a decorator in different modules, they will override each other. But if you put a module name in there, it will be an ISO name. So there's some room to improve it. Depends what you want to do, if you just have the one-off thing, that might be uh, good enough, but if, if um, you can always modify this one, that's a nice thing you can get inside and modify this function and this tool can be pretty useful uh, to help um, this memory measurement. And I have another one for me me memory measurement. This is a, uh, where are we? Yeah. Memory grows, it's growing, the memory is getting grow bigger and bigger. And this is this version here that is again and now I don't use a decorator, I use a different, different approach just to show you, you can also just use a normal function. So if you don't feel like using decorators, you don't necessarily have to, you can use other approaches. And here I just write a, a helper function that takes a function, takes arguments for the function, and doing the same thing here. Uh, and I, I have this, I get this one, set it back to zero, get my initial memory, call my function, and return this one and then just the application. But that's pretty much the same tool. And now I have my test here, I have my function big, and I have my grow where I just have my, have a list here, a global list, and I change the global list. It's not good style, but it's good for my example. So I have a global list and I change, make it bigger and bigger and bigger and see how the memory grows every time uh, I do this. And then I run my test function and should get the memory out here. So if I, I have this one. So it, that's a very similar to the other one, but I don't use a decorator. But the, the application is a bit different. There. And you see, uh, when I say make big, it doesn't change a lot because if you look at the source code, then I say make big. And I just get numbers and return this thing. And in the, inside the function, I don't actually, uh, I don't e actually uh, do something with it because I just call this function here, and but I don't don't save the result. I don't save the return value, just throw it away, so there's no changes, just as an example. So there's no, no changes here, but if, if I change this global thing, then you will see a change. And now I use a different version. I don't use a decorator, I just use my function, and I have to use my function, check memory, grows in this case, and use this function and the parameter put it in. So just a few helpers. Good. That's something to measure memory. There are a bunch of other tools. Uh, and I'm going to show you another one. So this, uh, it can be useful uh, to use different tools and compare what they give you. If it's the same, it might be cor correct. If it's not the same, then you might have a problem. Uh, though the second one is Pimpler. Pimpler is a merge between different, so I, I go a bit quicker now here, but it's doing pretty much the same, the same principle, but a different library, and there's a bunch of others uh, that I don't show you here. And the Pimpler is a merge of uh, uh, three projects, actually they came to, together, and works similar, so you say Pimpler import tracker, and then you say memory tracker, summary tracker, and you get something like this. So it looks very similar, so a bit different output, but you have sorted by types, you have the number of objects, and you have the sizes here. Yeah? And then you can say uh, tracker make print diff, and then you see the diff uh, here. And you can do this again and again until the diff is zero, there's nothing anymore. And then you can create a list, as we just did before, and do this again, and then you see the diff uh, from before and later, and then you s should see the size. And you have one list and so many integers. You, you may wonder, we have one million, but it's only 999,000 integers, because uh, CPython uh, uses integers between minus five and 256 again and again and again. It's just references, so you don't have so many. That might be the, the reason, because they existed already somewhere, it's just references, so they're not recreated. Uh, those kind of things, uh, that's why it's not exactly a million, which I created there. So now I have another helper, and I have another decorator here, and I use the summary tracker. Let's have a look. This is easier to look at the, uh, in the editor. So it's very similar, just a different tool. 
which is good to have a second tool, maybe even a third tool, and use uh, similar uh, data to measure, although actually it's the same. Um, this is this pimpler version here, and you see I import the tracker and then have the same function as here, and, uh, but instead of using this, this, this heap thing, I use summary tracker and get this before, and then I make the diff. So I do it five times to get ready to zero, and then measure the diff again, and then I, I get the changes. So it's a bit different, uh, looks a bit different, but actually it's the same thing. And so if, it, if I test this, I should see the same output here. So if I, instead of saying um, uh, HP, I say, Pimpler, then uh, haven't installed it. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so you should see the same output. I have probably I haven't installed it. When I don't know, of course I used it. Uh, there should be it should be the same output. So I have a pre canned version, so you can look at it. I need to install it later. And then if you if you run this, you you see pretty much the same output as uh, as you see this this uh, this this heap thing. Uh, good question. There are several tools around, uh, but some of the tools might, might have some problems. So sometimes you measure something, there might be some, something going wrong. You never know. Ne measuring is a difficult thing. And it's always good to have a second tool. If two tools give you the same result, it's, you kind of assure that, okay, if they give you a pretty different result, there might be some, some problems with one of the tools or something with your approach or something. So we always have good a second one. I, I, M the main reason why I have two because I use this this um, this heap uh, this guppy thing, but th they they they're stuck with two point six, so I used to look for a different tool. And there are a bunch of other tools. Yeah, yeah, I will do, do this thing. Yeah, yeah, I I, I, I use a different uh, uh, environment install, and then I do this in the meantime. And. Uh, there's, there's, a, there's a, if you look at some sites, there's, there's a few other tools. If on the, on the run snake side, they, says they use actually this run snake run uses a now new tool to make graphics. They haven't explored this one yet. So there are a bunch of tools, and most of the tools have advantages and disadvantages. And uh, yeah, see so you now this uh, should be the pretty much the same numbers. Yes, zero. The other one had 1,300, and yeah see what's coming out, it takes a bit. And there's other tools, and then you see now they have the ints, the size, and the size here is, yeah, looks very similar, yeah? Very close, yeah? There's, it should never be exact, well, it's pretty close, so it seems like, this is a very simple example. If you get more complex code, you might see some differences, yeah? Python, if you have longer running processes, you might have some, this garbage or whatever. But there, might, there might be some problems involved, I don't know, but it's always good to have some tools and if they're easy to install like this, just a few seconds and you have the tooling, yeah? That's a very good question. I don't know, big difference, 10%, maybe 20% something like this. So th you, I wouldn't go down to the percent. So if it's 10%, you say, okay, yeah, maybe some problem. But if it's like 100%, then you should really do something. So they <laughs> go off, yeah? Yeah, and yeah it depends if it's a like, as, as soon as you get this, this is one, 10% is like, okay, there might be some differences. And yet you can rerun and try again and change something and see if we're getting closer. Yeah, so do you see my tool that I wrote, this decorator, you can modify the decorator to what you want to do. So instead of writing to a dictionary, you can write to a log file. Oh. Yeah, wouldn't, wouldn't, wouldn't be already Yeah, it's already running, I'm not sure, I don't think. I know, I, I wouldn't, it does, you will get into chaos if you do this. You had to run it from the beginning on. But you can turn it on and off. So in your decorator, you can have a switch, turn it on and off with a, with a switch. So you just have it in the beginning, turn it off, and if you need it, you can just have a flag, true or false, and turn it on, and then it starts logging or 
whatever you like. This is something you it shouldn't be too difficult to do. Yeah. Yeah, so the run snake is, is, is pretty okay so far. It's, it, again, it's only Python 2.7, so there's no three version. I haven't seen anything any there. Uh, I haven't used those uh, those other visual, visualization tools, so that 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 work, work for me so far because it works with C profile, which is a nice thing. So you can just use the C profile output for this. So I don't have a really strong recommendation, but if you do some serious work, I would recommend to use several different tools and look what they spit out, and if it looks very similar, that's okay. If not, then you have to investigate why it's the reason. Is your code, is this a tool? Maybe some tool is measuring something, the other tool is not measuring, or the tool makes a mistake. That's, that can, be, can be the case that something, yes, something is just allocated and thrown away, and the tool is measuring or not measuring it. Yeah. So there, there, are, there are a lot of, there's only one truth, and a lot of things that can go wrong, so. You should do so. I, ha I don't have a really good recommendation. Just try it out and play with it. It's always a good idea. Okay, and then I have another one. Uh, and I actually visualize those things. And uh, this one, you would need to have Matplotlib in, in, uh, installed. But if you don't have it, you just see a table. So uh, uh, list growth, and then it's very interesting. You say Python uh, template list growth. And if you do this now, I'm Actually, in the background, I get this figure here, and you see this is this is how Python actually allocates memory for a list. It does it, there's a formula that always allocates it quite a bit, a bit more. So if you have a append, it's very cheap because memory is there already. You just write in pre-allocated memory. So and if it reaches, then make another step, another step, and that's a very nice graph to see. And if you uh, you only have like a uh, if you do like 100 million appends, you only have like 10, 100 uh, allocations or something like this. So there's something pretty interesting uh, here. And this should come up as the next one. And this one is a different measurement, but you also measure the integers inside. So this one measured only the, the list itself, but not what the list contains. And this one, because the list has the references there, and it just jumps. And this one also measures the integers that, and the, that, that I put in there, so you get a different different thing. And this is something that, that really helps. If I have this line here, that really helps you to understand um, what's going on. And this is, that's a, that's a different method. I can look at the code. Uh, let's have a look at the code. Then you see the different methods I'm using. And then you also see the matplotlib code. If you don't have matplotlib, you should see the table. I think a program like this that you see uh, a table. And I used uh, this one. Yeah, you see, that's, a, that's my, my function takes the length and uh, the, the size functions or different size functions. Yeah, And then I have my list. And then I just uh, call my size function here and have my mem here and go through this length and say append, 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 append. And then uh, uh, use my size function. <coughs> and for the size function, they have three of them. Flat size, a size of, and this get size of. So this flat size and a size of come from Pimpler. And uh, get size of, it's just a normal sys module that comes with Python. This, this helps you to give, give you the memory of one object, but only the object itself. Well, it gives you, if you measure, measure the list, you get the list, but not the numbers in the list, or the lists inside the list. So whatever's inside, it doesn't matter what it is. It's just the list itself. Uh, and this, uh, this um, Flat size is, is the same thing, but a size of measures also what's inside. And down here is just the matplotlib code to, to plot this. If not, I just print out uh, here a few numbers. So if you don't have matplotlib installed, then it's just print. So this is just this very quick throwaway implementation, but at least you see the figures here, and it gives, gives you some, some feeling uh, what's going on. So. That's a few pictures of measurements, and yeah, and there's also um, a memory profiler, 
and this one is doing the same thing as we did with a, with a line profiler. It can do this uh, line by line with the same, same concept. Uh, probably also install quickly, I've forgotten. Uh, memory profiler and then uh, you can use a memory profiler the same way you use uh, similarly to, to the uh, line profiler to get memory line by line. Let's, level, let's have a look at this. So I have an example here for this uh, memory. I didn't write the name of the file, which makes it more difficult. Use memory. No, use memory. Yeah. Okay. This is just an example of memory usage, and you see now I have it inside the function. And the interesting thing is now here I have a list comprehension that actually generates a list, and we have a generator expression which use, which calculates the sum without having this intermediate list. And I do this again for C, and then I have the squares where I do this squares with a. Uh, with a list comprehension, it was the sum of the squares, for instance. Then I delete something, and then I, I generate uh, uh, 200, 200 million A's here, and delete this X again, and return 42. So if you measure this with my pro with a normal thing, nothing happened, because everything is just local, and after the function is called, the garbage collector collects everything, there should be no changes in memory. But you can still see what's going on uh, with my Profile, so it looks very similar. You have this profile here, and then you have to run this one from the command line to see what, what profiling is doing. So I, I, I have to say Python minus m module. I want to run this module. Module um, memory profiler, and I say use memory on this one. And I didn't import this, which is strange. Why did it work before? Import this. And yeah, of course, I'm checking for Python 3. And now it works. And then you see the, the memory usage for all of them. It takes a bit, but it gives you a nice overview about the memory usage. It takes a bit. Probably I used a bigger number, 190 megabytes. Shouldn't be too long. So uh, the same thing, uh, typically if this is measurements, this one slows things down quite a bit. If you do this without the measurement, it's probably much faster. And also line profiler slows things down considerably, easily in an order of magnitude or so which is something you cannot avoid. Yeah. But yeah, so it's not really for production, but can be pretty interesting to see what's coming out. Maybe I should make this list a bit smaller first to see something I don't know why it's too big. That's probably too big for my machine here. So I kill this one and do it again. And then hopefully uh, you see some results. Probably let's just let it run now, because I think it's it's break time, if I'm not mistaken, for one and a half hours. Yeah, 
So let's have uh, let it run, let it use the time over the break. And then, of course, we have still have quite a few things to cover. I would like to show you a few more things. Uh, because now we just measured, and then now we want to switch to actually some strategies, how to make things faster, and then we start with algorithms, and then we look at a few tools that might be interesting for this. So we should have a break. It's, it's 20 minutes or 15 minutes. Uh, so list comprehensions are nice, but they generate this list, and if you don't need it, you shouldn't generate this. So that's a, that's a, that's a general thing. So if, if you uh, look at the, like, the ITER, tools module, if you're familiar with the ITER tools, um, they give you a lot of those tools that can help you to avoid generating those intermediate lists. And that can be useful because you use less memory, and using less memory and eventually can also l mean being faster in the end. So, and also you can work with much bigger structures because you don't generate them. Uh, you just use them and they, this, those, those generator objects, they always have the same size no matter wh what number you put in there. And that's something that can help you. So there would be an exercise here that would make these things clearer, but for time reasons, we skip this one. The next topic I would like to look, which is something you might gain something out of it, it's local versus global. So if I go to my editor, and I open the file local global, and this one is in yeah in algorithms local global, and I have this the um, short example where I use a global name global equals one inside a function, and I do this in this function and do it repeated times, or I before I do this I make this global function a local name, this global name a global name, sorry. So just this small thing and then see the difference and I, I do this and I just have a small helper function that's here using C profile and doing our C profile and doing this test for uh, 100 million iterations through this X range here and then print starts. So that's what, what we did by hand before. I'm doing now uh, in this script and I just go up to algorithms and I say local global and then it should take a while and then you give you a result. If, uh, the difference is doing this with a local and a global. You see, if I run through now we have this output and there's a difference uh, in there. So we have this uh, the, the, the repeat local, the test, and the repeat. So we have to look at the functions. Here, the function names. This is a repeat and repeat local are the two different functions we are using here. And then we have repeat local. It's four seconds and repeat 4.2, 4.8. So it's not a big difference actually here. It's a bit faster. Yeah, It's measurable, but it's not a real big uh, a big thing. I have another example and where you can gain some speed with some small things versus built-in. So Python now has to do even more lookups. So if I say true, true is a built-in in Python 2 at least, in Python 3 is a reserved code, but here it's a built-in in Python 2. And now I said true to true, make it a local. So it's, a, it's another level of lookup. Before we just had a local global built-in, now a local global, and now there's local global built-ins, another step in between. And if I do the same thing, uh, then I should see a bit different things, hopefully some, some different differences in the, the time it takes to, to get there. So because we use less, fewer lookups. And now uh, we have repeat and repeat local, and you see 3.5 versus 5.5 for about, so that's, there are some differences, yeah? Just this small thing changes things because you, you save some lookups. Because you know this Python lookup rule, local, global, built-in, and it's always going through. And every time going to the global, and if you set it to a local, you can avoid this. And if you call this function a lot of times, you can save, yeah, a third of the time or something uh, using this function in this, in this case, just, doing this. Of, of course, it's a, it's, a, it's a 
artificial example because in this loop I don't do anything else. So if you do a lot of other things anyway, this might not matter too much. So it's always a question of relation between this thing and, and other things, but in isolation, if you do a lot of these, it might help a bit and it, you could at least try and see if it makes makes sense for your application. And it's here you have to introduce this extra line. Yeah? And also now you have a lowercase true, but this lowercase true. Yeah. Uh, and this is something if you use it hundred million times, then that might might make sense, but who uses true hundred million times here in this case? Just but you can see it as an example that you can get some speed up doing some of those small things and if you do a lot of them uh, that can be useful. Okay, next topic is data structures. Um, so I just go through so quickly and I show you a different a few different data structures that Python offers that go beyond the uh, the built-in data structures and they, or the built-ins first and then also go beyond the built-in data structures. So the first one is uh, is built-in data types and then the first one is lists versus sets. So if you have this uh, thing when you have to search for something in the list, that can be fine, but if you search many times in the same list, it might make sense instead of using a, a, a list using uh, a set. So I have this here as an example. So I have, I have another tooling, I just say start, time it, default timer, and then I calculate the, the search time, and I do the same thing for a set. So instead of using, using a, a, a list, I use a set, it's the same function actually, you see, and just measure this time to searching in a set, and then I print out the ratio between these two, and then I do it for different sizes. You see, in a 10, the ratio is 1.8, it's about twi twice as fast doing it with a set compared to a list. And 100, this ratio goes up, and this the ratio goes, goes up to 1,000. So if you want to, you can also do it very easily uh, in here, in our IPython notebook. So we have a list, which the easiest thing would set an n to int uh, 100, maybe, and then the list is range <coughs> n, and our set would be set L. So, so we create this list and and the set, and then we just say time it. So it's a bit faster if you have these tools here, which is nice. Time it, and you say uh, th the last number, mm, the last number of our set. That would be or a number that's not even in there. So a number that's not in, even in there or some string that's not in there has to go through the whole thing. Through uh, L, it takes so long. And if you do the same thing with yeah, time it, do the same thing with the set. So I use A so it's not inside, so it has to go through the whole thing which is the worst case in this case. So that doesn't ever have to be like this. And then you see uh, a difference. You see that's nanoseconds and that's microseconds. Yeah, that is 47 versus 5,000. Yeah, that's a big difference already. And if you get bigger here, and you just, you're not so wimpy to do it bigger, then you see quite a bit di difference between those two. And that's 55 milliseconds and the other one is 18 nanoseconds. Yeah, milliseconds is a, uh, 10 to the minus 3, and nanoseconds is 10 to the minus 9. Yeah, that's more the nearly 5, nearly 6 orders of magnitude difference here. This is something you can do. Of course, it's the worst case. If it's the first element, then you, it will be different. So if you say 0 in L, then the case will be a bit different. Of course, 0 should be the first number in there. See, and there should be there should be no advantage doing the set if it's the first one. But you don't know that we're looking there. Uh, should be the same same time. So at least it's even a bit faster than a set, but not really significant. Okay, that's something uh, list versus sets. So the sets are in Python 
for a while now. They're built in data types, and if it's possible to do it. Uh, of course, if you do only one lookup and you have to convert your set into a list first, then you don't gain anything, because the conversion of the set into a list has to go through the whole list, and then you don't gain anything in, in this process, and then it doesn't, doesn't make sense. Uh, to do this, so I have this here. So if I do this, include this conversion here to a list, then uh, you will be, will be slower because the conversion costs time, and then you do the lookup on top of it, so it doesn't help. Yeah. So you have to. This is a line here. If you put this conversion, so if you convert it just for one lookup, it doesn't help. If you convert it once and do it again and again, then uh, it makes sense. So after, after the third lookup, also it might make sense to do this. So that's something. Uh, you should think about if you use lists or sets or other data structures in Python, there's something uh, uh, you can do, and there's just some conversions here. So if you do it multiple times, as I did here, then you start gaining something again. So we have different combinations of uh, how many times you do it and looking through. And also, if, if you want to look in something, uh, uh, in, in data structures, and you want to have the, the union, that's very nice. Uh, I'll just show you here. So we have this um, this list of this letters and this list of this letters. And if you're very naive, write an naive algorithm, then you would have something that's called quadratic here. And you go through the whole list. And then for everything that's in the list, in the other list, you append it. And you see th these are on both. But this means iterating through the list. And then for every element, check if it's in there. And you can do the same thing just with intersection, which is even much nicer. And you get the same result if you have sets. And then uh, if you do this, you are faster than uh, doing this. Is that, that's the first version, doing it with the lists. And this is the second version, uh, doing it with the uh, intersection. And then it's like list over here. And then. Uh, with a set, and then you compare both of them, and you see the run times are pretty different. Here's 10 to the minus 5, 10 to the minus 6, and you can compare this one and get the number out. You just have a small helper function that compares this two, and you see the comparison. And if, if it's uh, 10, the set is 2.7 times faster, and then it's getting bigger and bigger and bigger. And if you have 10,000, you're 7,000 times faster doing it this. The set, and then it even even makes it worthwhile. Very often, if you do something like this before you uh, start this loop, converting the list to a set, that's pretty cheap compared to the big overhead you have if you do this quadratic algorithm in there. But that's one of those simple things. And sometimes you, this, of course, this always seems like very obvious because it's a small example. But if you have a more complex code base, you might not actually see that the things like this happen. You might test things with small data, everything works, you don't see any problem, and then you do it in, in the real world and use big data and things are different, and you haven't even seen it because it's not that obvious as it here in this small toy example. That's always something uh, that can happen. And then there's, there's a, few, a few specialized data structures in Python you might use, and one of them is, is, it, is a deck. The deck is in the collections module here, uh, and then This is just helpful, another decorator that helps you measure speed. So I, have, I wrote another de decorator in this case. Um, it's the same principle as we did before. We have to get the function and we write another function that replaces it. And before, we just get a timestamp and we get a timestamp after. And then we can use our converter. I showed you in the very beginning to convert this to PyStones also to, to see some comparison between platforms. So this is just a helper here. But the main thing is now we have this uh, uh, function that removes something from a list. So though we have this function, we get a list and we have a start and the end and I want to remove something in one way of doing it, Python using this, this slice assignment. So it's slicing an empty list to this slice deletes something from a list. Yeah, because I can always delete, replace one slice with other slice, no, no matter how big the slice is. In this case, the slice I replace with is empty. So it eff effectively de deletes everything from the list. And then I have another one where I use my deck. This is the case now. Instead of one line, I have to write one, two, three lines. And the deck is an interesting, 
interesting data structure. So going back here where I create my, my, I don't show you where I create my text. Yeah, I have, I have to show it down here. Create my data structure. So the, the data structure comes from, from the collections module. I'll show you. The list is clear, how a list looks like, but the stack, maybe it's easier to show you live. I'll just show you this pre thing because it's faster, otherwise we have the, we don't have so much time. From collections, import stack. So this is a, uh, so if, if you're an iPython and you don't know what it is, you just say question mark and then it gives you some help. Built an auto collection with optimized access from its endpoints. So as I showed you, a list is optimized to be accessed from the end, but not from the beginning. So if you keep saying insert zero to a list, this is something that's pretty inefficient. And because it has to re reorder the whole list all the time. But the stack is different here. And I can work with the stack and make, um, make a deck. So let's say my, this is this one, and I create a new one, and I can just throw in a list, any kind of iterator will do, typically. And then I have this one, and this is, looks similar to a list, but it's a deck. And what I can do now is the thing, I can rotate this one. Yeah, I can rotate, rotate, say minus four, as I have in my example. Now I look at my deck, and now everything is rotated. You see everything is, uh, that used to be the zero, used to be there, now it's, it's there because it's uh, minus four, it's, it's going, four elements going to the end and I rotated the whole thing, minus four. And now I have endpoints and so now it's very efficient. I can throw, delete from, from the endpoints or can, uh, can pop from the end and then I can rotate those things back if I like to. You can, could say like, I would like to pop off, so delete uh, the last one, pop, just removes this one, pop, it's one way of doing it, and then I can rotate this thing back, so now it looks like this, they are off, and I can rotate this two back, I say rotate two, and I get it back in my, the, the I had before, and this can be more efficient than uh, using a list for certain cases, and I'll just show you now my results I have here. So it, sometimes it can be pretty useful. So I, ha I made the stack and I rotate it back and forth, pop it off, what I just did. And now I do this for, uh, I do this in this function here. Where are we? Yeah, so that's what I'm doing here. I rotate it to the minus end, and then I do it minus end, end minus start times popping, I top, pop so many elements off, and then I rotate it back to start. So that, that takes a little bit of thinking, yeah? uh, but it's doing essentially the same as, as what, what list is doing. So I move it, delete this one back, move it back in the, the right place. <coughs> and this is the same thing. And now if I do this, I gain a bit speed. So it depends uh, what combination I do. So I have a list in my deck and I have uh, the size. You see that that's a function here. The first one is a, up here is a start and the end. And now I delete everything from 100 to 105 out of my, of my deck of a million elements. And if I do this and uh, profile this one, you see here then the speed of the list is point Oh 05 and this is point oh oh 001, so to speak. So it's quite a bit faster. So you see this is 70 times faster if you do it with this one. No, that's, that's interesting. So 70 times faster doing it. Uh, but now if you do this not for five elements but for 990, so from 100 to 1000, then the story is different already. You gain only five times the speed. It's still faster. And then if you do it if, uh, from 100 to 10,000, you're getting slower. So, and that's very often the case. Uh, saying a deck is faster for this type of operation than a list 
it's not necessarily true. It depends pretty much on your use case, so on the size of the data structure, also what you're doing with it. In this case, of course, if I do have to do so many pops in the end and rotate it back, and this is in the end more work than doing this with a list. So that's not that clear cut. This is some maybe message. You should always measure it for your use case. You can try it out, but it's not guaranteed that things get faster, might get slower, because your data or your constellation in general is different for some reason. And that's just one example here. That you think, oh, okay, that's 70 times faster, you should do it. And now it's only half as fast if you're doing this one. Good. Another one is default dict. In Python, there's another structure. A default dict uh, is a dictionary you can access a non existing key. And if you, if you do this, you get a. a you get actually an entry in there. You see what I'm doing here? We have a, they have a standard way, and if you set default, then if the key doesn't exist, Python will set this key value pair as you apply with a default. So if I have a dictionary, maybe that's easier to show with a set default. So if I have a dictionary D, which has one entry, A is 100, then you can say, set default uh, A, which is just giving you back the 100 and doesn't change anything. But if you say set default B 200, then it gives you back to 200, but at the same time changes the dic uh, dictionary and puts in the B. Yeah, So that's what you uh, can do. So you don't have to check if it's in there, then do this, otherwise do this. You could also have it as a, have like a, a list to append. So that's something you can do like this, or you can use the, the, the default dict. So, so you can use the elections default dict, and you give it a function here that produces the default value. And in this case, int, yeah, int is, you can just call it as a, uh, like this, if you call int, you get, Zero. So any kind of any kind of callable will do. You could also put list in, or if you like to your own function. And if you if it's not in there, the default will be will be this. And then no, that's wrong. Uh, yeah, I'm in here. And then uh, you can do this here, and you get this get the same uh, the same uh, result. So you just can. Add to this. Of course, if the key is not there, it puts a zero in there, and you can add, keep adding the the one so that you can count how many times uh, letters are in your string. So you would need to do a set default first, and I have a two line. I have a one line of this default dict. And if you do this, and you profile the time, so this again, I do some profiling, do this thing, and uh, do some of this profiling with my decorator I wrote here. Then in the end, you get a very very slight speed up. So I thought that would be some speed up, so I, I kept it in there. But sometimes you need to uh, experiment with something. So the speed up is very minor, actually, in this case here for my use case. So if you have different use cases, uh, bigger ones, then you see a bit of bigger speed up. Now I have a million A's in this case, and I do this, and then you see a bigger speed up. So it depends very much on the data size you can do. Yeah, so there's a different example, and do the speed up, and here, is slower for some reason, so it's not always faster in this case for the small example. It's slower and not faster. And if you do it bigger, then it's a big twice as fast again. So for small ones, it's, it's, it's slower, and for bigger ones, it's faster. It depends on the, on the data size, and I have a few of these examples. Okay, there's just a few examples. There's more, and I have a short table that summarizes those things. Here, I have this, uh, what's called the big O notation, which is a formalized way to tell you uh, how long it takes to do some operations. And O1 means pretty much the operation is independent of the size of the data structure. When I have examples in the right box there, like if you ask the length of a, of a, of a list, the length of a dictionary, if you access an element of a list with an index, if you delete some entry in a dictionary, if you say x in dictionary or x in a set, and if you append something into list, this is pretty much O1. So it doesn't matter how big uh, 
this is. So this is very important for the in operator. So it doesn't matter how big the dictionary is, looking up something in a dictionary always takes the same amount of time. The next one is ON, so that means it's linearly dependent on the size of uh, data. So if you double your size, it takes about twice as long. And this is typically if you loop over lists, or if you say X in my list. So we had this, I this comparing the set and the list already with the IN operator, and that's exactly like this, O1 versus ON. So if you make your list bigger and bigger and bigger, it takes longer and longer and longer to, to look in there. And then sorting is O and log N, which is a bit longer than linear, but not quadratic yet, so in the middle, so sorting. And then O N would be quadratic uh, lists. We had this one uh, using so, uh, intersection nested loops, and everything else is something that takes very, very, very long. So you shouldn't do like the traveling salesman problem is one of these that takes very, very, very long. There's no infinity. So this, that helps to, to communicate uh, if it's one of uh, these, there's, there's a complexity of this algorithm, and this is good to, to have in mind pretty much that helps you to, to, to say, okay, checking x, x in dict is typically faster than x in, in list, and list is very small, but for bigger ones. So and I have some examples here, uh, again, with my profiling thing just to see how long it takes. So we have this uh, insert zero, which is a big anti-pattern. So if you insert zero something, then every time you do this, you kind of have to rewrite the list. Yeah? I want to put something in the front of the list. And the other one would be using append. And then the end reverse the whole thing because you want it the other way around. So you append something to a list all the time and then you finish, you reverse it. And if you do both of these, then you compare the, the speed and you see that the bigger you get, the faster you get with the append. So if it's small, it doesn't matter too much. But then this effect kicks in, you see here, if you use a, a million elements, it's 2,300 times faster in this example, though that's f uh, uh, f f several orders of magnitude faster. So that's really, really different. And this is a good example. And in Python, is, it's very quick to, to try this out. And I have a few examples here uh, for this comparison. And we have this uh, measurement here. And I return this comparison at these two iterations here. So reversing things and measuring. and you see the differences. Good. This is something about data structures. Uh, and this is something that uh, Python is very good because it, has, it comes with built-in data, data structures. And if you work with dictionaries, lists, and sets the right way, you can gain quite a bit. And this is something, if you work with algorithms, you cannot really get with a, uh, with a different programming language. I had this. One talk two years ago at the Euro, Euro Python about Python's fastest in Fortran because in Python it's very easy. To, it took, took me exactly nine lines to write a program that reads two files with coordinates x, x, y, z, does an intersection, and writes the output. If you do this in Fortran, it's, it's several hundred lines actually to get this done. And since there are no sets and no dictionaries, it's much more difficult than to use a, a, a just a naive quadratic algorithm that takes much, much, much longer. So this is something you should explore this one, and Python makes it very easy to use the right data structure because it offers quite a few nice built-in built ones, and the collections modules has a few more, and you can ex experiment with this. And typically, with uh, algorithmic changes, there's the biggest potential in saving, saving runtime. A few other techniques I would like to show you. The next one is caching. So because the fastest work is work you don't have to do. So if you just can avoid doing something again and again and again, then you can you might be able to speed up things. And that's the next next one is caching. You can reuse uh, uh, reuse things. So let's have a look at some examples. I just open uh, files here. Caching. So I have a, a small helper here. So if caching, it's can be useful, like functions that are deterministic, so the same uh, 
if you give it the same arguments, you get always the same result. Then if it's like this, then you might be able to cache because if you don't need to recalculate exactly the same thing again and again and again. And this is just a small helper here that just uh, helps me to generate a new key, unique key. So I get a function here in the arguments and I just, the function knows its module name and its own name. So this should be unique because modules are singletons of Python, so there's only one module with this name. If it's a qualified name and then the, the function name and then I just create here, I assume I can convert it to a string. So all the arguments and the positional arguments are converted to a string and all this keyword arguments and I use it to generate a unique key. So I have a unique key consisting of the qualified function name and the, 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 the arguments I give to the function and this should be unique. And if, you, if I do this, uh, I can use this uh, thing to uh, put something in the cache. So let's have a look, an example that, that might make more sense. So I open the file first deterministic. There are two different caches. One of them is deterministic caching. And here I use, I just import my helper function get key we just looked at. And then I use a decorator again. So decorators are great for these things because they, you can write pretty complex code in the decorator but only do it once and then use it over the place which wouldn't be that easy without this, uh, this approach. And here I have a, 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 a parameterized decorator. So there are three levels because I have to get this, give this uh, decorator uh, parameters. And the first one is uh, my get key. So I supply my get key function, but if the user wants, you, you could uh, use a different function to do this. And also my cache. The cache is a dictionary, but you can also supply your own dictionary if you like to. This is the thing. And then I use this memoize, I call this uh, helper function that actually takes a function that's supposed to be decorated. And then I create my replacement function that will replace the first function. Yeah, func to the reps makes it a nice decorator. Then I use this function that's going to be replacing the original function. And the first thing I use get key. I use my get key function and produce a key which consists, of, as we remember, of the function name and the arguments converted to strings. So it's a unique thing for this call. And if it's in there already, then I just return. I just return it from the cache and that's it because it's deterministic, it's supposed to be always the same. If it's not the same, you cannot use this cache, of course. If it depends on time or so, it doesn't work. But if it's like some calculations, always the same result. I currently return it. If it's not in there, I get a key error. And if I have a key error, I have to go on and actually call the function, produce a value, put the value into the cache and return the value. The next time, this value will be in there for this key. But the first time, I have to create it because I have a, a miss here. It's not in there in my dictionary. That's why. And then I have to do this return game. I have to return the replacing function and this one because this is it. So if you, if you it looks a bit scary if I have this uh, three level decorator, but just take it as a recipe. And the, the outer one just takes the, the, uh, the parameters for, this the parameters here for the decorator itself. And then you can use this one. And then let's have a look at an example. Uh, I do this now, I go to the directory and import it actually on, and run it. So I say cd, cd uh, caching, and I can say import uh, say from from cache cache deterministic import. Uh, memoize deterministic and I'm too lazy to, to type this out and just change it. Okay, now I have this, uh, this function there and now I can use this function to actually cache my uh, a function, a uh, decorator function. So I use add, this is this, the decorator here and it's uh, now uh, as a way I wrote it because it uses parameter, I have to use the parentheses as it can work. And then I have my function, very complex function here that returns e plus b. And I think I put something in there to, to make it, yeah. So actually I can, instead of 
using sleep, I say print. So something like this. So I just say something. So the first time I call my function with one and two, uh, uh, I would say plus, no comma. Okay. Then there's a second time you see if I call it the second time. Boy. Yeah, the second time it's 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 cached already. So it's just returning the, the cached result. So I <laughs> okay. So again, so the first time it's giving me the four, and the second time I call it, it just gives me the cached result. You don't see no calc. And if you look, you can look inside. So you have my uh, I can look cannot look inside because I haven't imported. I have to import this mode because the, the, the dictionary with this stuff is in there. But it should be there. Cache. Uh, S, C. And now if you look at site C dot, you have this uh, cache, which is a dictionary. And inside this dictionary, uh, you see, that's what I generated here. I have all this, this function calls. I have the name, the module name, this is main, the function name. And then you have these arguments, which I have in here, uh, one and two, which are positional. And here also uh, two and two. And then th that's the result, four. And this is my result I created here as a tuple. That's why I got this result back the second time. OK, so uh, you can also, if, if you want to, you can also call your function. You, you might see already you can call a function with a is 2 and B is 2 and then uh, you see it's again even though it's not smart enough to realize that at 2 and 2 and with a position of ones and with a keyboard arguments is the same so you might be able to do this I have to look at it but so if you look at the cache now there's a second entry for this actually the same calculation and see now the second one is a uh, these keyboard arguments you see they are in, in here as a keyboard arguments. There's no positional ones, there's only keyboard arguments. So that's just what it generates here in this case. So this is just some unique key. You can have a different function, different way, as long as it's unique and you really find the result, then you do it in the cache. And of course, it makes only sense if your, uh, if your calculation is somehow long enough, then you can do this. So, uh, but Python is pretty, yeah. The next one is, uh, the next one is um, non-deterministic. The problem is once it's in the cache, it will stay in the cache for all time and it won't get out unless you go to the dictionary and delete it manually. But you can also have a non-deterministic cache and this one here has an H. You see, I have to make it a bit smaller then you can see it. Uh, here I have, a, have another parameter which is called H0. And then I have this in here. And I can deprecate my value. So the difference is now that everything is the same we had before. But now I can deprecate it under some certain conditions. So if this thing is too old, so if the H is not 0 and my value H plus H, which I have here, which also store, we see later on where it comes from, is less than than the, than the time time, then it's deprecated. So there's a condition as things get too old, I want to deprecate it. That's how I implement it here. So uh, I throw it out and have this deprecated. And also it's the same thing if it's not there, the, 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 key, the key arrow I also say deprecated. And then if not uh, deprecated, I return the value. Otherwise I go, I get a timestamp, I put a timestamp in and I call my function. Yeah, the first value is this is a timestamp and this is a timestamp here. And if the timestamp plus h, which I supply, is less than time time, then uh, it's too old and I throw it out. And if I wait long enough, then it will be cleared. So that's one way of doing it. Of course, there are other ways uh, of doing it, but that would be one way to have it time-based and non-deterministic uh, uh, cache so it will throw things out. And 
this will be staying there only for a while, and if, it, if you come again after a while, then you recalculate things or redo it. That's something you can put inside. You could make it even uh, uh, more sophisticated changing. You now is apply the age as a parameter to the decorator, but you can also uh, do this and um, have, depending on some outside conditions, and check what's going on and invalidate things and or make it deprecated uh, to some other conditions. That's always something you can do, and this can be very helpful so you don't fill up the cache. Good, but Python is smart enough, so you don't actually need to write so many things yourself. It's very interesting to do it, to see how it works, but uh, this is uh, two implementations I just wrote. Uh, Python comes with uh, called, um, uh, that's just an example, it's non deterministic cache, it's throwing things out here, you just saw. Mm -hmm. yeah, so if you run this one, and after two seconds you have to recalculate otherwise. So Python comes with what's called the least recently used cache. So uh, starting from uh, 3.2, it has this. So if you have this, this 3.2, there's also a backport you can install. And this one gives you a cache that dep uh, depends on what, what uh, was least used the, the most, most frequently in, in the past. And this is something you can... Uh, you can also use the, um, parameters to to say what you want. You have a max size. If the max size is zero, there's no caching. And if you say max size is none and it works similar to our deterministic cache, so there's actually no, no limit, so it's different. And then you can also have a max size as a positive integer, then so many entries will be kept in this least recently used cache, LRU cache. And you don't have to go and implement yourself, it's in there. And the advantage is, if you do it yourself, there might be a few corner cases you don't cover, but this one should cover all the corner cases. So if you have this one, you see, okay, I have at least, um, the max size is two, so I will only store two values in my cache. And if I do this, and this is the same example as I had before, and I call it here, and this one returns immediately, and this one, is also in there, but now I ha this is filled with two, and I do a, uh, the two is, is still in there, and I do another call, it takes longer. Yeah, because you can only put two in there. So we, we can try this out. So if you put uh, more than two, then it hasn't been used anymore. Somebody else will s s uh, get in there, which has been used, and the old one will be thrown out, and it won't be in there anymore. So you actually can look inside, you get the cache info, and the cache info tells you what's going on in there. So how many hits the cache has, how many misses, and the max size and the current size. So you have a, quite a few information about this, this cache info, and this cache info is actually uh, in this, uh, an, an attribute of the add function. You can also clear the cache, you say cache clear, and the cache is clear, and you look at the cache info, everything is zero, only max size stays two. So that's something you can certainly, if, if you want to, you can certainly write yourself, but you don't have to, it's in there, and it's typically uh, better than writing it yourself. Also, unless you have some special needs you cannot get with this cache, then it's always rec recommended uh, to do this and just install the backport, and that should work. So that's one way of doing this, uh, working with cache. There's, of course, some tools, whatever you do, if you in, in the web, uh, uh, thing, you do web applications, you might use memcached or other other tools that help you doing caching. So it's not strictly Python, but it's the same uh, similar similar approach. Okay, a few more things I would like to show you. Uh, and now I would use an example which is numerically expensive, and this example we use, and we use different tools to try to make it faster. So, so far we looked at the small bits, data structures, small algorithms, now we use uh, the whole example, and you use tools to make the whole program faster, which can also be interesting. There are a lot of tools around in Python, so I don't give you a full comprehensive overview here with examples, just a few selected ones. There are way more, 
there's another uh, tutorial I was teaching was extension, extending Python with C. So we don't do anything with extending here. This was would be way too big a topic, and there are a lot of tools. But there are some tools that are kind of low-hanging fruits. They are easy to use, and they might they might work. And we look at a few of, of them uh, here. So let's look at the example. So we're going to be faster here. So this is an example. Uh, you might be familiar with this example calculating pi. So uh, this is a very stupid example in terms of uh, efficiency. It takes a very long time to do it, and there are much better ways around. But it's a very interesting thing uh, to see how you can improve a numerical expensive algorithm. So imagine we have a circle with a radius of 1, and you just have a, take a, a quarter of the circle, and I have a square with both sides are 1, and this is this, the part of my, my circle. And now I start throwing darts on this square, and I am guaranteed that all darts will hit inside the square here randomly. And now I can count how many of these are inside the circle, actually. So I know how many I've thrown, and I count how many on the circle. And if I do this, I do a little bit mathematics. So I say, okay, the, the, the area of my uh, circle is PR squared divided by 4. Of course, PR squared is a circle area, and that's only one fourth of it divided by 4. And actually, the square is R squared, because R is 1 in this case, R squared. And if I put both, uh, both ratios, make a ratio of both, put those formulas in, Reformulate it a little bit, I come up with this pi equals four times the ratio of those of those two areas. So, in, but I don't have the two areas. Instead of the two areas, I just take the number of throws. So the total throws is a it represents the area of the uh, of the square, and the throws inside the circle, the area of the circle. And if you do this, you will eventually get pi. So if you do this infinite number of times, then you will get pi. Of course, there's no, you can have, there's always something, you have to stop somehow, so we will never get to pi. Exactly, but you can calculate it. So that's something you can do. It's very inefficient, so, but it's interesting because for our application, we can use it to see how long it takes to calculate something. Okay, so I have this. I have an, yet another tool for testing speed. It's, it's very similar to the help I sh show you uh, here. It's this measure time thing. It looks like this. I'm, I'm using here. So th that's this, uh, uh, similar to. to what, what time it is doing. So there's a time it module actually, and the time it module uses a string. Uh, to, to, to calculate, uh, so, sorry, a string to, to evaluate as Python source code, and then you can measure how long it takes. And that's what I'm doing here. I use the time it module, and from this time it module, I use a timer, and I give this time it module a string here, which is actually just the name of the function, which I call this total, and then I just import from main total. That's just the setup code. Looks a bit strange. So Actually, I generate some code that Python will be used to uh, to measure time, and the only thing it's doing is just calling this function here with a with a number of total throws I want to do. Actually, that's what I'm doing, and the rest is just doing it here for all the names I get, for all the function names, and just making a nice table out of it. That's all. That's just the printing of the table, and then I have an example here how this actually works. And uh, if you go to the command line, you can see what, what, is, uh, what it's doing. So I have this function 1 and function 2, and then it's just say measure time. And I give it an argument 1, and then uh, give it the function names. And for this function names, it's doing the calculation. So it's a little bit, looks a bit strange, but it, it works, and you can take it as a tool. So I go to measuring, and I say Python measure time, and you get this uh, measuring. You see now, but you get you get this table, and you have these two functions with the runtimes and the ratio of the runtime. So if you have a bunch of function names in the end, you will get a nice overview of the table. It's just a small helper because in the end we want to have five or even more or seven, eight 
those functions and you want to see how fast they are and you don't want to look at the time all the time, so that's why I calculate the ratio and then make a table that prints all of them out a little bit formatted. That's the whole thing uh, this, this helper is doing. And now let's look at some different implementations and this different, uh, different tools. So first we start with pure Python and then we try to use some of those other tool tools that are available. So I just copy this. Measure time and the So we look inside. Measuring. Just one up, okay, thank you. Measuring, measure time. Uh, yeah, okay, should have it here. Isn't it? Yeah, that, that is. So, uh, now I have different implementations, and the first one is uh, uh, plain. So, just use a plain Python implementation to do this. Uh, ah, I, I include measuring, so it should work. I would need to comp copy it. And this, now I have this, this very simple function in Python. I use a random module and I have a count inside. So I, I, g I provide the outside, the, the total number of throws I have, and I'm only interested how many inside the circle. And as I count inside is zero, and then I go through, and I make two random numbers, x and y, yeah, my coordinates in my here, x and y, so I get the coordinate x and y. And then I just have to see if it's inside the circle or not. And this one is pretty easy. Uh, just use Pythagoras, so the, the square of x and square of y and the square root out of this distance. So if you, and then I check if, if it's less than two. So actually since everything is just between zero and one, I wouldn't need to do this, this square root thing, but I just kept in here to, to, to show and also to show how to do some mathematical computations and then I, Increment the counter inside, and when I'm done, I just have four times the ratio of these, and this gives me the, the pi. So, and if you do this here, and now I use my measure time, and actually I use this pass append, I didn't, wouldn't have to copy it. I just, yeah. Uh, and then I do this, and then, then I see the time it takes t to run my pi plane here. To, to import this and see how long it takes. Of course, it's the table only with one entry because I only have one, uh, one entry. Plain, so it takes a bit. Maybe the number's too, too big, can make numbers smaller. And it takes a while and have three repeats and you see the run times. Yeah, so why so big? Big first. Takes so long. So that should be a bit faster. So now we calculate pi and gives me the runtime. Of course, the ratio to itself must be one. But I see it takes about two seconds. So that's not really interesting yet. But it's getting interesting as soon as we use more uh, modules and compare. So now my, my first thought was okay, I look at this code and I said, okay, uh, this is. Pythagoras, there's a, if you look at a mass module, there's a function, Hypot is doing exactly this. So my first thought, using built-ins should be faster than doing it by hand. And that's what I did, so my next, the next, imp, uh, next step is using mass pi, and I'm just saying, okay, in this case, uh, I'm using, instead of doing the square root and the squares of x and y by hand, I use Hypot, which is do, doing exactly the same, and throw those two n random numbers in there. 
Uh, and then, um, yeah, so uh, you could also use X and Y, but we'll put it in, makes it maybe a bit faster. And I, I thought this would be, that would be faster if we do something like this. And then I you see now I have, I import plane P, both of them, and have this plane and mass, and let it do like 400,000 int five times, and let it run and compare. And I should get a table out of it. And just to, just to mass pi. And then when you run it, you see uh, it's only a little bit faster in this case. And actually, I used to have a use case that was much, small, much slower with an older version. And it doesn't really get faster. And actually, I'm cheating because I'm, I have this x and y not in there, obviously. So you should have something like this. Something like this, and use x and y because you have this assignment, and then yeah, you know, it's not exactly the same. I don't know why I didn't change it. So x and y, something like this. Yeah, and now uh, if I rerun it, you will see we wouldn't gain if you gain a gain a lot. If we do this, it should be now comparable because the rest is a. Uh, same, and then actually the the mass is a it's a bit faster in this case, and I, I still remember I had a case where the mass was slower than doing it with plain Python. So obviously it's changed here at this place, and it's fast. But it's not really that big a, a change as I thought, and the, the reason is if you use this this hypot function, they, they do a lot of more work. You see now it's the big. The difference are very small. I do a lot of more work because if you square numbers, and numbers are very big, you might get problems that the numbers are getting too big to be represented, and they do some numerical tricks to avoid this, which cause they are more exact, are cleaner actually. Because if I just square my x, it's just one. That there's no problem. But if the numbers are very big, you might get out of uh, the size of double, and it might be a problem because squaring is to make a number much bigger. And though they do some numerical tricks. If you look at implementations, they do a lot of extra steps so you don't get a lot of speed. So that's this some, some lesson you learn. You have this feeling it should be faster, but it doesn't gain you as much as you, you would, as you would hope. Okay, that's one of them. So the next one, uh, the next one I'm, I'm doing, I'm doing the same thing. I don't change anything. I use PyPy. Pi. So you might heard of about PyPy. PyPy is around for quite a while. It's a new implementation of Python, written in R Python, restricted Python. And those people are doing it pretty smart, but they have, have some things called a just-in-time compiler. So it's something similar to Java. Uh, so at runtime, this PyPy is watching what you're doing, what Python is doing, and then it figures out, oh, it's doing the same thing all the time. I can compile this something to machine code, and that's what they do in the background. And this is very useful for this type of thing, because if I do the same thing all over, over again, especially those integer loops as I do, then Piper has enough, enough time, what they call, to warm up and to actually uh, just in, makes this just in time compilation worthwhile. If you do a lot of different things and all from the beginning, PyPy doesn't give you a, a lot, but here I use PyPy to run uh, this uh, plane just as we did before. And you see it takes that long, and if I just use Python to run plane, though it's not that easy to put that in, uh, in one file, but you can still compare the, the runtime it takes, you see 1.8 seconds versus 0.3 second. So that's quite a bit faster, doing nothing else but typing PyPy instead of Python. Of course, PyPy is nice. The problem, it doesn't work with all C extensions. So not everything you use with normal Python might work with PyPy. So everything that's pure Python should work. And there are quite a few of things, C extensions, that actually work. There's a long list of compatibilities on the website there. But you will certainly find a few things that don't work. Obviously, those some of those profiling things or whatever. There's, there always might be something that doesn't work uh, there. So that's why PyPy is not not always just a one-to-one -one replacement uh, for normal Python, but can be pretty interesting. Just because you don't have to do much, you just use PyPy, and things are getting getting faster. And you can use also PyPy 
see at pi pi at this my uh, mass, you see what's doing there. Yeah, and that the plane is faster than the mass, this pi pi, for some reason. And it's, but it's still quite a bit faster than the Python. The Python version is three seconds up here, and my version is only half a second. So about six times faster without doing anything. This, that's a typical speed up for this type of problem. So PyPy is not always faster. If it depends what you're doing. If you have some code that somehow doesn't lend itself for this optimization with the JIT, it won't, you won't get much faster. And if Python, PyPy runs totally without a JIT, it's typically slower than C Python. So or the, the JIT cannot do much, then you won't gain a lot. And there might be some, some occasions where actually things get slower. Okay. Uh, the next step is number. Number is a very new tool and it's very interesting. It comes from scientific area and they have a similar, similar approach in terms of using a JIT, a just-in-time compiler, but they do it differently. It's not a different Python implementation, but it works together with normal standard Python, which is nice because you can use it with normal Python. And it works also very nice together with NumPy, because it comes from the scientific field. And you can use number. And number compiles a code to the, the intermediate code that works, what's called the low-level virtual machine, LLVM. It's a big project, and they do all this just-in-time compilation in the background, and number takes a Python code and converts it there. Uh, this project is very much in flow, and I realized my example doesn't work with the latest version. It works with 0 0.11, but it doesn't work with 0 0.12 of the result. I just, because they have, they, they stated on the website they did some changes, they have some regressions, a few things don't work anymore. Of course, they have to catch up and replace it and do things. But it's very much in, in development. Uh, last, was in, in February, I was at Pi Data London, and I talked to Mark Florison, who's one of the developers of it, and they, they, they're getting somewhere, but uh, it's not really for production, but still interesting to, to see what's coming out. And let's have a look at, my, at this number example. So I'm, I'm using uh, this number. So the first one is no change. I just use normal, my normal uh, function. It's exactly the same thing I have with Python. And the only thing is I use this decorator. So decorators are all over the place, obviously. And I just say number, JIT. And I, I tell number, OK, this takes, uh, takes an in64 and returns a float 64. I give it type information to help. There's all the auto JIT, so if I don't give it, typically numbers is able to figure this out. It's also watching what you're doing and figures out that what it's doing and then it's using just-in-time compilation to make things faster. That's the theory. Let's look what practice is doing. So I do this uh, here and I and have my, uh, I have a version that works with this type Information have auto JIT, where I don't do this type information. And then I have this normal Python version here. And then I use, it, use JIT it, because this one here it is doing the JIT. Every time I execute the same thing, JIT is going through. The, the, the way I measure it, if I measure several times, they're doing it there again. The JITing will be measured. And here I do it a different way. I can also say JIT yeah, and uh, give it a function. That's exactly the same as a decorator, but uh, now I get a jitted function, and it's in it, I don't measure the jitting time, because I only measure the execution of a jitting function. And actually, it's, I think it's the same, same time, sorry, it's, because this jit is only done once, but it's, there's a different uh, alternative approach doing it. And then I just throw all these functions in there. So I have my original pi, which is the normal Python version, and then I have all those number versions I'm doing and doing it uh, um, a million times. So let's try this. What's coming out? So it, I use normal Python, Python, and I say number, no, what's the name? Uh, number pi no change. Python number pi no change. And then it takes a bit. And then you see, because now I have to run all those five or six or whatever functions several times, and then you get an output of the, of the times. And hopefully this, this works. You see now, uh, this, uh, this number version, the, the digit version is the same, and 
and the auto JIT is slower in this case, it's in my case, than the plain Python version. But you don't gain a lot. 1.3 and 1, it's not that much. Uh, and the problem is um, uh, a few things because number actually is calling out to Python and using the Python functions for the random numbers, so you don't gain a lot. So, the, it's not just a drop in replacement like Piper in this case, but now you want to do something and you would like to use uh, uh, the random numbers. For instance, a random number generator, so I figured this out, the random number generator is the one that Python uses and you don't want to do this, you want to use a different one. And therefore, uh, I use a, look at the random number generator and I do a, a few things. So I <coughs> actually create my own function that generates random numbers, and this is not the one that Python is doing, but the no, it's some, some one that's uh, uh, number supplies, you see. And for this one, I have to do a few things. So I have number no debug, then I have a few of those variables that, that help me to do generate this random numbers to get the same random numbers as in Python. And I just use this function here. So I have to have this random, which is from number, and this one would give me the random number in this interval, zero to one, just so exactly the same as Python, and just put this in and get this number back. This just auto jit this one, and then I jit the same thing, I just this, this function, just know that auto jit is jit, so no argument here, but a return value of float 64, and then no jit. I don't jit it, and just to compare it, and then I have a random number here, uh, which I use this uh, four different ways of doing the random numbers so to see some differences again. And then uh, I just uh, use time it a little bit different here, just compare those random number generators, how long they take. It's just first to get a f feeling. And it's just those three, I throw those three in uh, here. Uh, no JIT, rent and rent JIT, those three, and go through and I use time it. Again, time it wants a string, so I need to generate this function call. This is just, this is a format name, it just takes this name and calls a function. It's just branch it, parentheses, branch it, and so on. And for, before this, you have to have the import, uh, and have to import this one from this module here. So if I do this, I can see the differences between the random number generator. So if they get, you see, that it takes a bit of investigation. Uh, to see what's going on, to get a feeling what's going on with this random number generator, and eventually, you see now, uh, if you don't have a JIT, it takes about two seconds, and with a JIT, it takes 0.1 seconds. So a factor of 20 difference. That's quite a bit of difference, yeah? So that's something, obviously, there's something, there's some problem. I need to uh, JIT this one. And then, actually, that's what I'm doing here, now I use my random number generator, I just generated the fast one, and I use number pi, here, and uh, do this, I get my random number, the fast one, here, and then I use auto JIT, and then I have to say no Python is true, so I don't want, if I do this, then number checks that I don't call Python. If I, if I would have done this before, I would get an exception, say there's, there's Python inside, so I want to make sure there's a Python inside, no Python, and now I use, instead of, of the random number, I use rent. Mass square is okay, mass square is replaced, otherwise no Python would give me some message here. So, but rent rent now is the different random number generator, not the Python one. Because it's expensive going back to Python, back and forth, you don't gain a lot. And if I do this now, uh, I do this again, uh, and I do all this kind of things, and I say no Python here, yeah, all over the place. We we'll have these different versions, again, the plain Py version, and then my jitted versions, and com compare them. And if I do this uh, Python, uh, number pi, and then uh, you would see differences now. The, before we had just 1.3 differences, and now uh, we have a difference of 14. So this is a that is a version that's hasn't changed, yeah, and that's the fastest version, and this effect of 14 difference. You see, we had to do some work to get the random number to work, but now we have a factor of 14 difference and we can work uh, uh, with this number. 
So again, it's, it's new, it's changing fast, but it can be, can be really useful for things. We, we, we see in PyPy we had a factor of six or so, now we have a factor of 14, because numbers typically more targeted to numerical things, and we give it more hints also there. So we have to do more work, but we get a bit more out of it. So you, if you compare it with a compiled C compiled function, it's still a bit slower. So if you do it by hand with C, which I don't show here, it's still a bit faster. I have two more approaches, what you can do very quickly. The next one would be NumPy. NumPy, NumPy is a very stable module as compared to Numba, which is a very new number. And NumPy is a very stable. And then, but it's a bit different, so you use, instead of using uh, the normal mass methods, you use NumPy. And NumPy always works with arrays. So the arrays are in memory. So you pay a little bit more memory overhead and there will be a limit. So if our normal uh, pi, you can run with very big numbers, just takes longer. But here, if you use two big numbers, you will run out of memory. And you use NumPy random rent here to get random numbers. And then the square root. And then you can use this thing, dist where. So it, it takes a whole array. And everything where the whole array is less than one, it's true. And then you just take the first entry and you get the length of it. So this is just checking for everything that's less than less than one, but doing no loops. So NumPy is everything without loops. If you do loops in Python, it gets very slow. So you want to avoid loops to push everything to NumPy and let, let it do the work. And then if you do this, you can run it. And then if I run this one uh, now, Things are getting, also a million times, things are getting faster. So if I run NumPy now, you can, you can do this. Python, NumPy. And now it's also a million times. And it's 0 0.08 seconds. So it's a bit faster than NumPy. This is, this is 0.13, it's the same number. And here's this is 0.09. So it's, yeah, still, still several percent faster than doing it. So you have to throw everything in together to, to run it, but you see, it's faster doing it with, uh, with NumPy, if, if you're familiar with it. So it's, it's, of course, it's overhead. NumPy is a big library, and you have to learn a little bit how to do it. But for numerical tasks, it works for everything. And uh, it's been around for many years, and it's very stable. One last approach I would like to show you is, uh, uh, is multiprocessing. So multiprocessing comes with Python, and you can use multiprocessing with two ways. And <coughs> So there's a lot of things you can do. So multiprocessing, uh, here, there's extra module for this multiprocessing here. Uh, the first one is processes pi, so you can start different processes. Um, and there's a, there's a second, I'll show you a second approach. The first one is very similar to threading, to start like several threads except they're not threads, but they are processes in the background. And the other one is, has a worker approach because everybody's, everybody's doing the same thing. So uh, this one is, still works with older versions, so it's starting from Python 2.6, it's in there. So if you still have run a very old version, you have to say import uh, uh, processing, but 2.6 has it, comes as a standard library. And that's what I'm doing now. I just have to do a few things. Since I do multiprocessing, I have to chop my, my task into subtasks, which is very simple because pretty much every count is independent of the other count. That's the whole thing here. So it's very, very embarrassing parallel, very easy to do. And that's what I'm doing. I have a new function, which is doing only part of the work, it's only counting inside. It's not doing the very last step. So this is the first thing I'm doing here. I just count inside. And then actually, I can have several of those counters, and the end, I just sum them all up and divide by the total number. So I have two of them, everybody is a million. This gets 500,000, this gets 500,000, they give me the numbers back and add them back up. When I have 10 of them, I do it with 10. Just chop into 10 equal sizes, assuming all the processors are the same, uh, which is typically the case. And that's what I'm doing here. And I have to chop it apart in several things. So I have this calcpy here, which is giving me the four total, those the this is the last step, actually. And then I have to use a queue, uh, which is how you send this message to this process. Multiprocessing, starting multiprocesses in the background, and uses pickle to communicate. And you don't have to bother too much how this works. You can just use it very similarly to threads. Use a queue and say, okay, 
I put this in a queue, you do this, and then you're done, you give me the result. And that's what I'm doing now here. Uh, uh, first, I have to chop my total into sub-processes, you have integer division here, yeah? And I chop it into sub, that's what I'm doing, it, into equal sizes, I just have the number, and then there's a remainder. So if it, if it does, it's not really equally di dividable, so the last one gets a little bit more, which is fine. It's just one more than the rest, which wouldn't matter if you talk about millions. And then I go through and have this count here, and then I have my queues, which is a list, so it's quite a bit of work, you see. And then I go to those counters, make, it, make a new queue, start the process, give it the target, count inside process, that's this guy here. So everybody gets this count inside. No, oh, sorry, count this one, count inside process. And then they put this, this count inside with a total into queue. So you send everything to queue and start it. Very similar to thread. And this is asynchronous. I started, and they do something now. And I go off. Uh, and you, you say, of course, I have to save all the queues and the processes so I can access them later. Now they do something. And then when they are done, since they are, all have the same tasks and they have the same strengths of processor, should take the same amount of time, ideally. And then I go through and say, OK, get, get this blocking, actually. And I get the result back from this process. So it's a, it's a bit involved here. Uh, maybe a bit fast through. But this is what you have to do to get it in parallel. So it doesn't really matter if you just have a small function or a bit function. This is pretty much if you want to use those things, you have to go through and throw this on these four press sources and then get things back. And then this is just a sample here. And I do this now. And I have actually, I just check if I use one processor or two processors. Uh, you can also use more if you have more processors in the machine. I only have two real cores and, and four if you count hyperthreading in here. And then and just have some, some timing and see how much faster I get. And you will see if you use small numbers, total of 1,000, then multiprocessing will, get, will actually gets much slower because you have a quite a bit of overhead to starting this. And if you do this in Windows, you might see even much more overhead because starting a process in Windows is much more expensive. I think in the new Python versions they did something with it, but in general it's, it's pretty expensive because here on Unix systems they use a different different uh, way of doing this, like this fork, which just doesn't, it's not really good. Hmm? Yeah. But it sh should still work, hopefully. Thanks. this? Oh, yeah. Yeah, one time. So obviously I changed something and one time. Thank you. Yeah. Probably some automatic replacement I didn't pay attention, I didn't check again. Uh, Yeah, so you see, if, if I do this, and uh, if I run with one process, it takes zero, three zeros, and with two processes, it's much slower because the number is so small. So this, this thing, uh, the ratio is uh, it's 0 0.04, so much slower. If I go up with a number and use bigger numbers here, and then you will see that things getting faster. It takes a bit longer, and now, uh, the, the ratio is 1.4, I'm, I'm faster with two processes already. Yeah, so you need a sufficiently big problem to make it worthwhile to, to do this multiprocessing. And if you get even bigger, they should see even more. And you could also use more processes, so you can use four processes, see what, what's going on with four processes here on my machine. Typically th three would be maybe better. Yeah, yes, it's now it's two times faster, so it's getting faster. Uh, so it's pretty close because you won't get much more. I have the experience if you even use four processes with a hyperthreading, it doesn't help much because they all do the same thing. Yeah, so that's something you, you, can, you can do. And there's a little bit involved. There's a simpler version. If every, every worker is doing the same thing, then you can use this, uh, this uh, pool, pool approach here. So you can use a pool. And then this is the same thing, but only this parallel thing is a bit simpler. So you don't have to start a simple process and queues and do, you just make a pool of workers, 
here. So I use a CPU count now. If I do this one, I get a four because CPU count is four. And then I do the same domain t equivalent and I chop it apart in, in the sub problems. It's the same thing. But now it's getting simpler. I just say pool and I get a pool of so many brokers as I want. And then I say apply a synchronous. So I don't have to do the creating the queue, put it in the queue, take it out of the queue. And that's it. Apply a synchronous. It go, goes off and I save them all in list comprehension. And then I just say result get, which is blocking. You get the result for all the results. So that's a bit shorter if you compare the other one. You save a few things and should be about as fast, about the same time. And this is where if all the workers do exactly the same, then the pool is probably the, the better solution. With threads, you can have every, with, with process, you, every thread process can do something different. Uh, with the pool, you have to do the same thing. Therefore, uh, it's shorter here because you don't have so many variations. And if you run this one, then uh, it's getting faster. It's the same thing here. It's some reason, I don't know what's happened. I must have some other. Yeah, there's also no time. So obviously some replacement went over to replace everything. Yeah. So. Okay. Uh, yeah. And if you run this one, it should be the same. So if I go over up to a million, four workers there, and I have this uh, million here, I should see the same, same run times actually. Uh, if you do this, and of course, Cool, I think. And then the run time should be the same. The, yeah, 1.9. It's about the speed up and the run time is 0.3 seconds. So pretty much the same. Of course, you can com combine those things and have a last, the last one. You know, we're just on time. The last one would be using NumPy and the pool together. So you can do several of these things. So I actually, am, I'm, I'm combining these two approaches now. I just, in this just, this count inside is not the plain Python version, but rather my NumPy version. And I can do the NumPy and can use it in parallel. Use the parallelization here, which is fine. And the rest is the same, only this function is different. And if I do this now, I never go to, uh, there's no time over place, but no. Uh, doesn't matter, it still works. And if I if I run this now with a Python pool numpy, then it should be much faster. You see, because now I run it in parallel, and uh, the ratio is not as not as good because now it's so fast that you you don't gain so much. You have to make it even bigger to get faster. But you can combine those things. Good. This is this. Uh, I think that's it for my handouts. Yeah, the combining this whole thing and then looking at output, and I have a, a, a full output at the end. So let's wrap this up. So that's multiple processors here, those different things, and then I have the combining all of them. I have this script that's combining them that takes a while to run, but I can show the results all those different kind of uh, versions we have running together, you get a table looks like this, and you have the different versions, not, not the parallel versions in this case, and you see which ones are, are faster and which ones. And now you see there's a, in this case, there's a factor of more than 100 between the slowest and the fastest versions. I have a run here, and I have different versions with NumPy inside and parallel versions here. And now the difference is only a factor of 17. And you can see which one is faster and which one takes takes long. So that's something you can play around and see uh, what you're doing. There are a bunch of more tools. So just to wrap it up, at the end, I have a table of all those tools you can use. So after you have measured everything, you know everything, you should go for alg algorithmic improvements. We looked at a few examples. Certainly, there's more. And then there's NumPy. Psycho is an old version that works only with Python 2.6. That's it's like uh, Psycho is part of, of PyPy, so to speak. It's, it's a just-in-time compiler that used to work with normal Python. It's not extended and it works only with for 32-bit Python and only 2.6, so it's pretty old, but 
just was a very interesting experiment because now it's part of PyPy. Slicen is a different tool to wrap uh, C. An extender, use it from Python, very interesting because you can start from pure Python and step by step introduce more features that are C like and just this will be compiled to a C extension at the end. And it, if you do it right, you write much less than you write a C extension by hand when you get full C speed. So I didn't touch it here because it's too big a topic. It would take too long to do a justice to, co to cover it. C types is interesting. It's a part of the standard library. You can wrap existing standard, uh, shared libraries. So if you have something written in C, you can do it. It might be. CFI is new. It's also a similar, similar approach to C types. It's new. Uh, it works with Python and uh, C, Python, and PyPy. So you can also access C. N number we saw. Then you can write extensions by, by hand. And there's a bunch of, bunch of tools here for writing extensions. Uh, some of them are a little bit outdated. Uh, not used so much in a week, used to be a lot, uh, but now since Sison also can wrap C++, there are some people, Sison Boost, Python is also one, I have used myself. There's a bunch of tools you can use here, also Fortran tools, there are some uh, CUDA and OpenCL uh, uh, tools, so working with uh, these GPUs, if you, if you want to, these general purpose GPUs here. Uh, Copperhead is another, there's a bunch of other uh, approaches I haven't listed here. Most of them are pretty new and some of them are just experimental. But this one, they potentially give you all of the magnitude speed up of numerical codes. If your problem is fit to this one and you can parallelize it this way, you can get a lot. The problem is if you really want to do uh, uh, GPU programming, it's very different than normal programming. Okay, you see there's a lot more you could cover, maybe it'll give you some hints. And I think, you, I think the main message is measure, 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 and also question your measurements. Don't just trust what you measure. Uh, it's not that easy, but it happens to me sometimes you think that has to be like this, and it, it just doesn't turn, turn out. And there's a bunch of tools around, and I just showed you a small selection of tools, but there are many more tools for different uh, problems. So you're encouraged to, to search around and find some tools, and as very often in Python, there are good quality and they work. And I hope you got something out of it and you get faster Python programs. And I wish you a very nice rest of the conference. <laughs> Unless you have any questions, so I haven't asked for questions. <laughs> Yeah.